Okay, we are live. notice it before I do. It's humid outside. It is very humid. I have lived my entire life in Florida and I'm about tired of the humidity. <laughs> Don't make enough money to go to uh, Hawaii yet yeah, though. So <laughs> is that the place you like to be? Hawaii? Oh they only because they don't have much humidity. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Can't afford Hawaii, but you know, the weather is nice. <laughs> have you been at a visit though? No. Oh, I hope you can go somewhere. We have um, a lot of partner schools in Hawaii. You too. Yeah. We have partner schools all over. But um, so I talk with them quite often, the instructors. Well, they should pay for you to come out sometime. Yeah, I know. I keep saying that. Let me come out and lecture. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be a guest lecturer. All right, so good morning. Let's see here. Let me adjust the camera a little bit. Okay. Okay, how is everybody this morning? Good. All right, well, you had um, chapter four between last class and this class, and it was on body systems. We will be reviewing that together in just a few minutes. Um, but let me get your scores for chapter four. If you didn't get to it, just say pass, and I'll get it from you later. Maria? 100%. Thank you. Marva? 100%. Thank you. Katie? Thank you. Jara? Thank you. Alyssa? Very good. Jordan? Jessica? Which one? In? 100. Sorry, I should. I, I have to put a something there to remind me. Um, Jeanette? 90. Sheridine? 100. Thank you. Emily? Jessica S? Brooklyn? And Kevin. All right. So let me grab a chair because we're going to have a little discussion about the different body systems. And um, I'm going to be lazy today. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to borrow that chair right there. Thank you. Okay, so chapter four was a little complex, had a lot of information in it. It went over all of the body systems, what they're made of, um, what diseases they um, can kind of cause or um, be affected by. There was just a lot of information there. This isn't, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to put this. It's covered on the written test. So you need this information for the written test. But it's not going to be done in the way that you think it is. So it's not going to ask you, what is the respiratory system made up of? They're not going to ask that. But they do want you to know a little bit about how different body systems are going to uh, be affected by certain diseases because that is going to impact our ability to tell normal from abnormal. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what I want to spend some time going over first thing this morning. We're going to cover all 10 body systems and I'm going to explain to you the different normal signs of aging so that we can easily identify abnormal. 
or things that need to be reported. So we're gonna start with the nervous system. And the nervous system is made up of the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. Those of you who are going on for nursing, you're gonna get super, super, super deep in this. Um, you will have to go through anatomy and physiology. Um, good morning. Uh, one and two, which is an entire year of nothing but body systems, the components that make up the body systems, how they work, and they take you down to a cellular level. We don't have to go there as CNAs. You're not going to learn about mitochondria and Golgi bodies and nuclei and cell membranes and, you know, um, sodium and potassium channels. You're not going to learn about all of that. So what we're doing is literally a very, very surface level um, review of these systems. Understand it goes way, way deeper than this. Um, but the nervous system is the system that controls everything else in your body. It's kind of like command central. If something is wrong with the nervous system, it's going to affect everything, absolutely everything. So when we think about strokes, okay, the stroke is an interruption of blood supply to a part of the brain, not the whole brain, just a little neighborhood of the brain. So um, how many guys are aware of the um, ship crash yesterday in Baltimore? Everybody, okay. So news travels fast, certainly. Um, so those of you that don't know, a container ship ran into a bridge in Baltimore. The bridge collapsed. Um, six people, unfortunately, are still unaccounted for. It's a tragedy. It's a horrible thing. Um, and it's going to have widespread effects. You know, container ships aren't going to be able to get in and out of there because there's a bridge in the way now, right? So they're going to not feel the effects of or, or the, you know, Baltimore is going to feel the effects of what happened at the bridge for a very long time. Now, we heard about it out here in Florida. You know, we, we're, we like saw it on TV, you know, watch the replay. We've heard about it. But it's really not going to affect us too much. Right. We're way down here in Florida. We got our own shipping channels. It's not going to interrupt our delivery of goods and services. Right. But it might have some minor effects in that it also affected the cruising industry because cruises go in and out of that port. So there might be people from Florida that are anticipating taking a cruise that are now having to make other plans, right? So there might be some indirect effects, not directly affecting us, but some indirect effects, something that happened way far away. Does that make sense? Well, this is when we have a stroke, what happens? The area near the problem area, right, where the stroke occurred is going to feel the most effects. But even areas way far away might have some indirect effects. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So your nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord, it controls processes all over the body. So if we have a stroke, that means that we may not have feeling in a certain part of our body because the nerves are what control the feeling, the transmission of those impulses. We may have limited mobility because the nerves are what cause the muscles to contract and move. So um, you can have indirect effects in other places. Now, the brain, like any other organ, ages with us. And we talked a little bit about this a uh, couple of classes ago, that our body is a factory and our factory ages. And one of the parts of the factory is the brain. The brain is going to age. And your brain, in addition to controlling everything, it also produces memories. So the factory that produced memories when it was brand new, state-of-the-art, high quality, right? It's going to produce really good memories. So memories that are created early in life tend to stick with us the longest because the factory that made that memory was a good high quality factory. 
Okay. Does that make sense? And we're going to get into that a little bit more in, in an upcoming lesson um, because it's going to affect how we respond as patients to some of these skills. So remember, anything that is learned early in life is going to stick with us way longer. But this is also why we can have an older person that remembers the shoes they wore to a piano recital when they were 12, but they have no idea if they had lunch. No clue. What time's lunch? You just came back. You just had lunch. You had a BLT. Don't you remember that? Well, no, they don't because right now their factory is not producing good memories. So we need to understand that so we don't get frustrated with them, right? We don't want to say, don't you remember? No, if they remembered, they wouldn't be asking. Their memory factory is offline right now, and that's okay. That's normal. That's okay. We're going to help fill in those gaps. Does that make sense? So sometimes not being able to recall recent events is kind of... Um, A, a side effect of aging. Anybody ever um, go into a room and can't remember why you're there? Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe misplace your keys, right? So the memories that we, and guys, the more distracted we are, the more this happens. Is that why sometimes um, kids or even adults with ADHD, autism tend to forget really quick stuff more? That's more of a distraction, okay? It's not that the brain isn't um, creating those memories. It's that we have distracted our brain to the point that um, it may have created the memory, but it has no idea where it stored it because it wasn't paying attention at the time, okay? So um, we do this in our current life, even those without, that are not neurodivergent, um, we do this all the time in our current life because we are so fractured, right? Has um, anybody in recent history sat in a rocking chair on the front porch and shelled peas? No, we buy our peas from the freezer section in the grocery store or in a can, right? So years ago, we had a lot of downtime. We had a lot of time for our brain to just be. You don't have that in your life anymore. You are running from place to place, from thing to thing, from crisis to crisis, and your brain is always spinning. You don't have time to just sit on the rocking chair on the front porch and, you know, let your brain just kind of be, right? So distraction is going to play a big part in this. But it's also because of aging that we kind of lose the ability to catalog things and remember things as well as we used to. It just doesn't work real well. Now, coordination is also going to be affected. So um, balance, this can affect balance. So as we get older, our muscles are weaker, our nervous system is not working optimally, and these things are needed to uh, control balance. And this is why older people often fall because of these balance and strength and coordination issues. And that is a normal sign of aging, okay? Now, somebody that was walking just fine yesterday and not walking fine today, that's a sudden change. Aging does not happen suddenly. If anything is a sudden change, what do we need to do with it? Report it to the nurse, absolutely. Any change that is sudden requires reporting. But a normal gradual decline, eh, we kind of expect that, right? Um, slower reflexes, decreased concentration. Now, decreased concentration is a big one, um, primarily because they simply don't have all of the cylinders running. So you may tell an older person something, and 10 minutes later, they don't remember what you told them, and they may ask. This is particularly important with dementia patients because dementia patients, um, their brain is broken. And you're going to be reading about dementia over the weekend. Chapter five is all about dementia. Dementia just means broken brain. It doesn't tell us how it's broken. It's just broken. Um, 
so when we're working with dementia patients, we want to be careful not to use the words, don't you remember, or I've already told you. Those get you nowhere. You're not going to teach someone with dementia to pay closer attention. Their brain is not capable of doing that. That's like telling my car, you need to change your own oil. My car is not physically capable of changing its own oil, right? So telling a dementia patient, you need to listen, you need to pay closer attention. You're not, that. it's not, they're not capable. Their brain is not capable. So we've got to be careful when we're dealing with dementia patients not to get frustrated ourselves and just answer the question every time it's presented as if it were the first time. Because maybe this time it will be able to be cataloged and stored. But maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. There's a big difference between dealing with dementia patients as an adult and a child. A child is going to ask you why a million times because they're learning cause and effect. They're actually learning emotional manipulation. Anybody have a three-year-old that asks why all the time? That, that, that's actually what they're learning is emotional manipulation because they know if they ask you enough, you'll get frustrated. They are learning how to manipulate emotions. And believe it or not, that is an important skill to develop because you have to deal with other humans in your life. And throughout your life, you will be in positions where you're going to have to use your skills to get a desired effect. So that emotional manipulation is actually a very important skill to learn. Now, when we're on the other side of it, it frustrates us. Quit, <laughs> right? We yell at kids. Um, but they also have to learn limits. And that's our job is to teach them limits. Now, when we're working with dementia patients, they're not saying why all the time to manipulate you. It's not your job to teach them limits. That is appropriate with children. It is not appropriate with adults. Totally different mechanism, totally different stage. But yet we tend to treat dementia patients like children. There was a situation here in our community, probably about eight, 10 years ago, where um patients in a locked dementia unit started to lose weight and they were looking into it and somebody put a camera in the locked dementia unit. And what they found was that the staff was withholding food from dementia patients. If they did not say, please, they were trying to teach them manners. That is not your role. You are not there to teach an adult anything. Not your role. And this is why we have to have CNA classes because people out there will get something in their head. Well, I have to feed them. I have to change them. I have to dress them. Therefore, I can treat them like a child. And no, you can't. They're adults that need physical help, not training. You guys understand the difference there? That's why we have to have classes. You guys could all figure out how to do most of the skills I'm teaching you. It's this stuff that you need to understand. Does that make sense? So that's what I need you to get out of your reading in chapter five. We do not treat adults like children. So any question that you see on the state exam that has an answer that, that is something you would do to a child, restrict, force, um, discipline, any of those words is never, ever, ever the right answer. Let me tell you, there are some adults in this community I would love to teach some, some manners to. Okay? As an adult, I don't have the right to teach another adult manners. You either have them or you don't, but it's not something you can teach to adults. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So these are all normal things of aging. Remember, anything that happens suddenly must be reported. But your older patients are going to be slower. They're going to have decreased coordination in most cases. The cardiovascular system is the heart and the blood vessels. So think of blood vessels like highways that um, distributes blood throughout the body. This system ages as well, just like the bridge we were talking about. You know, the bridge is older and it crumbled because it aged, right? The metal gets weaker, the um, uh, cement chips away, you know, the um, rebar that's holding it together gets fatigued. I mean, there's all things with aging. Well, just like that, your heart and blood vessels also show effects of aging. And your blood vessels can become weaker, thinner walled, which means blood can leak out easier. And you can have um, big, like bloody areas that show up underneath the skin. It looks like bruising. That's because the blood vessels um, were weak and blood leaked out. Your heart muscle becomes weaker and it doesn't pump as efficiently, which means that the muscles aren't going to get the amount of oxygenated blood that it needs when we um, are doing physically intensive exercise. So they're probably not going to have as much endurance or as much strength because of the blood flow. Does that make sense? You can also get higher blood pressure just because the inside of the arteries tend to clog up. Just like, you know, the pipes in your house. You pour grease down your pipes in your kitchen, eventually those pipes are going to clog up. Well, in this case, the pipes are clogging because of the food that we eat and all of the saturated fat collects on the inside of the arteries. No, thank you. No. No. I've got to learn how to turn that off. Okay. So Fatal asks, good morning. How are you all doing? Take my exam and I pass the written, but not the skill. Any tips for the skill? I'm going back tomorrow. If you were to give somebody a tip for the skills part of the exam, what would that tip be? Louder? Follow the care plan. That is the one thing you need to know about taking the, the uh, skills exam. Follow the care plan. Okay, you can make corrections up until you say you're done with the skill. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, should you put your hands into the supply cabinet before you've washed them? No, because you want to keep clean supplies clean, right? Um, should you touch the patient before you wash your hands? No. Um, what should the patient know before you touch them? Yeah, what you're going to do, who you are, you know, all of those things. So those are the things you want to remember during the state exam. But number one, follow the care plan. <laughs> follow the care plan. That care plan will help you. Carolyn says, thank you for your explanations and videos. I'm officially a CNA. Woo! -hoo! Congratulations. Great job. We're super proud. Super proud. All right. So our cardiovascular system is going to age along with the rest of us. And we're going to see some effects. Remember, anything sudden gets reported to the nurse. So if we have somebody that was walking to the um, dining room every day all by themselves, no problem. And today they're really short of breath. They have no endurance. They're, um, you know, really struggling. That sudden, what would we do with that information? Report it to the nurse. Absolutely. And interestingly enough, the cardiovascular system is what um, ultimately, generally, um, is the cause of death of most people. It's, you know, the, the heart will hold on just as long as it possibly can. But once it's done, nothing else can survive. Okay. So show your heart some love. 
All right, the respiratory system, this is kind of tied to the cardiovascular system. Think of them like uh, siblings, right? They have to work together. If you don't have good air coming in, then the heart circulating blood isn't going to do any good because that blood doesn't carry the oxygen that we need. So we have to have the lungs working to get us oxygen. We have to have the heart working to distribute that oxygen. So these two tend to work together. They're not the same system. They're different systems, but they tend to work together. So if we have a heart problem, our lungs are going to feel the effects. If we have a lung problem, our heart is going to feel the effects. These two are tied together. And this is super important for us to understand because you're going to be dealing with a lot of patients that have congestive heart failure. And the number one sign of congestive heart failure is difficulty breathing. So we need to understand that this is not the same system, but they do, they're very closely tied together. Okay. Make sense? But as we age, the lungs, lungs are really elastic, right? They expand when we breathe in, they contract when we breathe out. They're very elastic, but just like every other part of us, they get, it gets less bendy as we get older, right? So we don't get as much air in as we age. Less air in means less oxygen to circulate, less endurance. Um, so, excuse me, decreased lung volume is going to uh, be a, a really big effect of aging that you're going to see. Yes. Does that mean that their respiratory rate is higher? It could be. It could be. Naturally, they're right. It could be. Um, in some cases, though, what they're going to do is just decrease their energy output. So they may not be breathing faster just because they kind of slow down and uh, there's no, not as much demand on the body. But if they're up walking to the bathroom, you're absolutely right. You're going to see an increased respiratory rate just from that simple walk to the bathroom. Okay. Um, so less endurance, shortness of breath, these are things that you will see uh, quite commonly. Now, what's interesting, do you guys remember talking about the layer of fat underneath our skin, right? And this is why a lot of older people retire to Florida, right? Because they can't handle the cold. Well, the problem is that when you're in extreme heat, it can make it hard to breathe. So you can end up with a lot more shortness of breath. So even though they're here because they can't handle the cold, the heat can be um, just as problematic on the respiratory system for them. And then you add in the pollen. Oh, yeah. So um, it's not uncommon for older people to not venture outside um, during the summer months very often. Okay. Does that make sense? No. No. How did I turn that? Hey, Caitlin, make a note for me, please, to try to figure out how to turn the speak or the uh, microphone off on the TV. All right, so now we're going to go to the endocrine system. Your endocrine system is your hormone production system. And when we think hormones, we generally think estrogen and testosterone, you know, teenage hormones and all of that. But those are only those actually make up such a very small percentage of the hormone production of your body. Um, you produce way, way, way more hormones um, and way more important hormones, actually. So your metabolism is based on the production of thyroid hormone and parathyroid hormone. Your bone density is based on parathyroid hormone production. Your ability to um, uh, metabolize carbohydrates and convert sugars into usable energy is controlled by the pancreas, a hormone called insulin. You've also got hormones that control your heart rate, your um, fluid retention, 
Uh, you've got um, adrenal hormones. You've got so many hormones in your body. And all hormones are our messengers. They send a signal or actually carry a signal from one place to another. They're messengers. So if we don't have good messengers, that means that every body system can be potentially affected by this. So decrease, decreases in your endocrine system can cause um, sleep disru disruptions, decreased bone density, a reduced metabolic rate, uh, which means that we don't um, burn the calories that, as effectively as we used to. Um, it can have a lot of different effects in your body. Okay. So remember that sex hormones are just a very small part of hormone production in the body. Um, yeah, there's, there's, a, you don't really need to know too much about that other than it will affect pretty much all of your metabolic processes. Remember, sudden means report. Urinary system, we're going to spend a lot of time on the urinary system coming up here uh, next week. So the urinary, your urinary system is made up of your kidneys, ureters, bladder, urethra. Um, it's how we handle our waste products and how we produce urine. Well, just like everything else, this system is going to age. It's going to become less efficient. So we may not be able to remove as many waste products from our blood as we used to. We may not be able to hold the urine as long as we used to. Because remember, the bladder is going to get less flexible. It's not going to be able to fill as much. The valves that hold the bladder closed are not going to be as rigid and as um, uh, what we call competent, which means you may have some urine leakage. Um, you may not be able to wait as long to go to the bathroom. In fact, that's probably the most common one, where now you guys are all young. You can think, oh, I probably ought to go pee at some point, but you can put it off an hour, maybe even two. You know, you get busy doing something, it doesn't cross your mind, and, and then it's like, oh, I think I need to go. And you go, right? Well, when we're older, we may not have that amount of time that we had when we were younger. It may be, oh, I think I need, oh, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> And now we're trying to find it. Well, that's important for us to know because remember we talked on the very, very beginning of the class that toileting is the first thing we think about with patients, right? Toileting is the first thing we think about with patients because everybody's going to have to go. Well, don't make the mistake of thinking like you, the patient can hold it, right? You can think, I got to pee, but I can wait. When your patient thinks I have to pee, they have to go. They don't have that lag time in between. So if your patient hits the call light and says, I need help going to the bathroom, you don't need to go to break first and think that they can hold it because that patient will probably get up all on their own and walk to the bathroom to go to the bathroom rather than wet themselves because that's a dignity issue. And then you come back in and you yell at them for getting up because I told you, don't get out of bed unless I'm here because you're a fall risk. Remember that whole decreased coordination, decreased nerve impulses, decreased muscle strength, right? So we tell our patients, don't get out of bed unless I'm here. They hit the call light. You don't come. They're not going to wet themselves, guys. That's a dignity issue. They're going to get up and walk to the bathroom and go. And you do not have the right to reprimand them about that. I made a mistake this weekend. Um, we brought a grandma to grocery shopping. She has Parkinson's, so she walks slow. And she has difficulty to keep herself like straight or with masks. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, I will go with you because we stopped to eat. And she had a hard time opening the bathroom door, so I decided to go with her. And then I was holding her by the side, walking slow with her and talking. Then at one point, she was like, I don't care about you, what you're saying. I need to go to the bathroom. Like, oh, I'm sorry. And then I let her go because she really needed to go. And I was kind of like holding her back because I thought she needed to go in a slower pace. But she, yeah. 
Yep, time to go. <laughs> I don't have time to wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But that but that was a great learning experience yeah. for you though. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the biggest thing that I want you to remember to take away from this whole lecture, and I keep going back to it, is not to judge your patient's abilities on your level of ability. Just because you have an ability does not mean your patient is going to. If they had that ability, they would not need you. Does that make sense? And yet CNAs do this all the time. I can remember you just had lunch. Why can't you? I can hold my urine. Why can't you? I can sleep through the night. Why can't you? We tend to judge our patients based on our level of ability. If they had our level of ability, guys, they would be in their own home taking care of themselves just like you. So because they're in our facility, that tells us they don't have that same level of ability. Quit trying to project your level of ability on them. Do you guys see that? That's where this lecture is going. And you'll, you've heard me say it with every body system. We're going to keep saying it. Okay. Um, but with uh, the urinary system, decreased emptying is often uh, a, an effect of aging. So if we put all this together, right, they can't hold as much, which means they have to go more often. They don't have as much time to wait. So they're going to have to hurry to the bathroom. And then once they get there, they probably aren't going to completely empty. There's going to be some left. So in a half hour, we're right back to I have to go to the bathroom because the bladder was taken up by some leftover urine. They can't hold as much and they can't wait as long. And this is why our patients often have to go to the bathroom way more often than you do, like every half hour, every hour. And that's what we're there to do. We're there to help them with that, not get aggravated because I just took you. They can't help this. Trust me, if there was a cure for aging, every person on this planet would take it. You wouldn't have any pushback at all. There would be lines down the road. Give me that injection because I want to avoid this. Every person would take it. This is, you can't get around aging, guys. You can't. So we need to understand what that means for our patients and how we can effectively help them. Toileting, number one task we're going to be doing with our patients. Number one. You're going to do more toileting than you ever thought possible. But it is helpful if you get your patients on a toileting schedule. It is helpful. So those that can't hold it as long, every hour. Those that can hold it a little longer before every meal. Okay. But getting them on a toileting schedule will help them and you. Okay. Don't be inflexible, though. If they still stay, they have to go in between. Take them. But toileting schedules can help. The integumentary system, this is the skin, hair, and nails. This is the largest system in the human body. It's the one that keeps out pathogens. Remember, we talked about that, right? So our integumentary system is super, super important. It's also affected by age. So the integumentary system, specifically the skin itself, becomes thinner. It dries out because we don't have as much oil production. Our nails get brittle. Uh, we talked about that with hand and nail care. We have a decrease in subcutaneous fat. We talked about that as well. 
the hair doesn't have as much color to it in a lot of cases. We end up with gray hair or white hair. Um, we end up with a decrease in facial hair growth. Um, especially, we end up with a decrease in hair growth, period, right? Head hair growth, facial hair growth, but also um, in the extremities. So where you might have a lot of hair on your arms when you're younger, you have a whole lot less of it when you're older. Okay, so hair growth is affected. Um, we also can get darker pigmented age spots. And I always found this kind of funny, ironic. Um, we lose pigment in our hair. We gain pigment in our skin. It's like, I'm yeah, <laughs> you guys got some wires crossed. If you could put that pigment back in my hair, please, I wouldn't have to go to the salon, right? <laughs> So um, it's it's kind of like the body gets a little wonky. It, it starts putting color where, you know, there shouldn't be some. And then you'll end up with some light spots on your skin as well. So less pigmented areas. So nothing is really uniform. Okay. Um, but the skin is probably one of the um, areas that we're going to be most focused on because it's the visible um, body system. So when you see big um, patches of um, dry skin, we need to bring that to the nurse's attention. Don't just grab some lotion and throw on there because it may be a symptom of something else. The nurse has to know. She may tell you, hey, yeah, just it's fine. Just go lotion it. But it could also mean that something else is going on and that the nurse needs to be aware of it. Does that make sense? So anything that we notice here, we want to, to notify the nurse, okay? And don't do anything until you talk to her. Right, yeah, don't implement any action yourself. The best rule of thumb I can give you is if you say, I think, stop. Stop. You don't have enough information to make that assessment, okay? Um, because... By the way, a large patchy area of dry skin can be a symptom of an ele a very severe electrolyte imbalance. And if you don't report that, if the nurse doesn't get lab work done, we can miss something that can ultimately kill that patient. That's how important what we do is. And that patch of dry skin could be anywhere, right? Sure, anywhere, yeah. Yeah. It could just be dry skin. Mm -hmm. Something very benign that we can put some lotion on and no problem. But it could be a symptom of something much, much worse. So we have to report that to the nurse. Okay. Reproductive system. This is obviously affected by age. You end up with decreased hormone production. We did talk about that. Um, Particularly with females, decreased hormone production can result in night sweats, hot flashes, difficulty sleeping, agitation, irritation. Um, you can even get decreased moisture production. So um, sweating becomes an issue. Sweating is our a body's ability to cool ourselves down. Remember I said a little while ago that... Um, you know, the, the heat and humidity can affect older people. Well, if we don't have the ability to sweat to cool ourselves down, this can have an impact on um, our temperature regulation. We can get um, sexual dysfunction of a, a couple of different ways because of decreased hormone production. We can get thinner, drier skin, and of course, decreased fertility as well. Um, there are some males that retain fertility throughout their lifespan, and you know they father children at 80 years old. But for the most part, um, females are going to have that decreased fertility um, problem as our hormones age. Okay. The one thing I want to mention here is do not make the mistake of thinking that old people do not have sex. And don't make the mistake of thinking that sex doesn't happen in clinical facilities. It does. 
the biological drive to reproduce is strong and it remains strong throughout your lifespan. So as much as you like sexual activity now, you will continue to like sexual activity throughout your lifespan. And to the extent that you are able to participate, you will. So do not think that old people do not have sex. This is important because if that door is closed, you probably ought to knock on it before you go in. Okay. There are some things in life you cannot unsee. Be careful. Sex happens. Probably the most ethical problem with this, and this does happen a lot, is in um, locked dementia units when we have dementia patients. Because sometimes dementia patients will um, fixate on somebody else that is a patient there and um, can form romantic entanglements. Um, and it's hard to keep them separated if they think that they're married. Um, and this can cause really ethical problems if one or both of them are married. So um, this is not a situation you need to be involved in other than to report it to the nurse. If you notice two residents holding hands and getting close and snuggling, you definitely need to report it to the nurse, not in a um, gossipy way or, oh, isn't that cute? No, that that's inappropriate for you to have that reaction. Clinical, we need to report it. I've noticed that these two patients are becoming close. Um, and that way we can put steps in place to try to maybe minimize the effect on the patients and the families. Okay. Remember, dementia means broken brain. So consent is impaired. Okay. So there are some ethical and legal situations that have to be handled by those with way more um, knowledge and authority than me. <laughs> Don't bring it to me. Take it to your nurse. We have ethics teams for that. Gastrointestinal system. This is your stomach, esophagus, uh, liver, intestines, colon. This takes food in and pushes waste out. And this system is affected pretty significantly, actually, by the aging process. A lot of older people can't eat foods that they once enjoyed. And that will frustrate them. Oh, gosh, I used to love pizza. I cannot eat it now. So that can affect their dietary choices. Um, gastric emptying is slowed, which means that when they eat something, it takes longer to move through the system. Constipation is common. So we want to make sure that they're getting good exercise, that they're drinking enough water because those things will help. A lot of times with older patients, if you've seen the list of everything that we've gone through, right? So we have decreased lung volume. We've got uh, affected heart that's a little bit weaker. We've got decreased coordination. We've got decreased muscle strength. So we're not active when we're older. We spend a lot of time sitting. The problem is that our intestines require activity to move stuff through. Your intestines are smooth muscle. They don't move on their own. It requires the muscles around them to move stuff through. So if you've got an older person with all of these issues sitting around all the time and not being active, and then we come along and we say, you're a fall risk, so we're going to make you sit there and not move much. Well, all we're doing is setting them up for constipation issues, right? And that's a pretty significant issue. So we want to make sure that they are allowed to do the things that they can do on their own or with a little bit of help. And that activity can actually help everything. It helps the lungs open up. It helps the heart beat a little bit more effectively. It helps our skin. It helps our muscles not get weak. It helps our nerves remember how to communicate. It helps everything. So. 
we've got to be really, really careful about using that fall risk as a justification, which actually puts the patient more at risk. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is decreased hunger and thirst. And thirst is a big one. Your thirst reflex diminishes greatly as you age. And this is why a lot of older people suffer from dehydration without even realizing it. Because they just simply don't get thirsty the way they used to. Um, so this is a big part of what we do is encouraging older patients to drink. Like every time you see them, hey, Mary, did you drink some water? Hey, Mary, remember, drink water. Hey, Mary, it's water time. You're going to be trying to remind them to take a sip of water frequently because they all left on their own. They're less likely to do that. Um, they also probably will want their larger meals earlier in the day. Um, just because things take so long to move through the digestive system. And um, a lot of older people find it difficult to sleep with a lot of food in their stomach. So usually meals become earlier in the day, larger meals more in the midday time frame, rather than, you know, when we're younger, we tend to eat our larger meal at in the evening, at night, at dinner time. Okay. So this can, um, this can affect it. The other thing that I want you to be aware of is esophagus muscle tone diminishes. Now, muscle tone all over the body will diminish as we age, but particularly in the esophagus. And what this means, this is the tube that connects your mouth to your stomach, your esophagus. What this means is that um, they're going to have more trouble swallowing, particularly liquids thin liquids. And those liquids can drip down into the lungs because those two tubes, your trachea, which is your breathing tube, and your esophagus right behind it actually join at the very top. And there's a little flap at the top that closes when you swallow to keep stuff out of your lungs and opens when you breathe to let air into the lungs. Okay. So this little flap just moves back and forth. Make sense? Well, if our muscle tone is diminished, that flap doesn't do what it's supposed to do a lot. And fluid can drip down into the lungs. So if you notice that your patient is coughing a lot when eating or drinking, you must report that. Must report it because our patient is at risk of aspiration. Okay. Good. We can actually thicken liquids to help prevent aspiration. Then we have the musculoskeletal system. Um, this is your muscles, your bones, your ligaments, your tendons. The musculoskeletal system is kind of what keeps us upright, gives us a body structure, and moves us around. These are going to be affected by aging as well. Your bones can get a little more brittle, less dense, which means they're more at risk of uh, breaking if you fall. Your muscles become less elastic. Um, your ligaments tend to become shorter. So we have some mobility issues. We're also going to have some endurance and strength issues. This is why a lot of older people would just rather sit and watch the world go by <laughs> than get up and move. You guys ever hear that saying, a uh, body in motion tends to stay in motion, a body at rest tends to stay at rest? Well, that really applies to the human body. Um, it's a physics principle. It actually was initially, you know, based on objects, but it applies to the human body too. The more a patient sits, the more they're going to have to sit because they lose. So when in a clinical setting, when we come along and we say, no, don't get up. You need to stay in that chair. You need to stay in that bed. This is what you're doing. You're actually setting something in motion that they may never be able to climb out of. 
So a good part of what we do is actually encourage our patients to be as independent as possible and not make them overly dependent. Now, their motivation may be pretty low, so we end up being part-time cheerleaders as well. Oh, come on, Henry. I know you can do it. Come on. Let's, let's get up and go brush our teeth at the sink. Come on, Henry. Okay. Good. And then finally, we have the lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatic system is kind of one of those shady systems that a lot of people just don't really understand. But think of it like the recycling system of the body. You have fluid inside your blood vessels. You also have fluid between the cells. Like a lot of our body is made up of fluid. Well, sometimes we have too much fluid between the cells. It has to go into the vascular system. Sometimes we have too much fluid in the vascular system that has to go into the cells. So it's kind of what we call the fluid shift system. And your lymphatic system is also um, predominantly involved in your immune response as well. So the lymphatic system plays a very large part in um, maintaining good fluid balance, putting the fluid where it needs to go. And over time, it just isn't as effective. So have you ever had a situation where you stood up for a long time and your feet started to swell, right? But then the next morning, you went to bed, the next morning, your feet were fine. Well, that was your lymphatic system doing its good work. It took the fluid from where it wasn't supposed to be and put it back where it was supposed to be. Good work. But as we age, that system may not be as efficient. So if we have swelling, it may take a whole lot longer to get it under control. Okay. Remember, anything sudden gets reported. Okay. This system also affects our immunity. And because it ages, we tend to not have as good of an immune system as we age. So if we have older patients in a clinical setting with a lot of diseases, it's probably pretty important that we understand that they don't have the same immune system we do. That way we don't give them anything that they didn't come in with. Okay. Good. You will have the replays of this as well. All right, so let's review some of the things that we've learned so far. When we're taking a pulse, we're always going to support the, okay. Uh, the pulse is always reported over what period of time? One full minute, but how do we know how long to count for? The care plan. What's our normal values for pulse? 60 to 100. What part of the finger do you want to use? Fingertips. What finger can you not use? The thumb. And um, where is the radial pulse located? On the thumb side or the pinky side? Thumb side. And what do you want to say so the evaluators count with you? Start and stop. And because you counted something, what do you have to do at the end of the skill? Document it. Yeah. yeah. Tell them to stop, but we have to document at the end. Okay. Um, Dressing a resident with a weak arm, we're going to ask them what they want to wear. wear. They get the right to choose their own clothing. When do you want to get the clothing, before or after we undress them? Before. before. We're going to lift from above or below? below? Below. And what are we going to do to the joints as we lift? Support them. Very good. Um, how do we remember how to undress? It's on the USA. screen. USA. What does USA stand for? Undress strong arm first. Which arm gets dressed first? The weak arm. The weak arm. Very good. We don't want to overextend or force movement, right? Don't injure your patient. And then at the end of the skill, after we get them dressed, we want to take a look at them to make sure the clothing is 
presentable, neat, fastened appropriately. Okay. So um, just adjust your clothing. Where do the soiled items go? In the hamper. Don't leave them on the table. Don't leave them on the bed. And do not, in any circumstance, put them on the floor. All right. And where should we put the call light? Stronger hand. Very good. And an L care. Again, if we're going to move something, we have to support it. All right. Um, we're going to soak what in water? The hand. Yeah. Whenever we wash, we rinse. rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Very good. Um, we want to place, when we take the hand out of the basin, do we want to just put it on the table? What do we want to put it on? A towel. We want a softer surface for that hand to lay on. Um, which edge of the orange stick do we use to clean under the nails? The flat, the beveled side. Yeah, not the pointy side. And what do we want to do to that orange stick between the nails? Clean it, wipe it off. Very good. Um, when we're using the emery board, which way do we file? One direction toward the center. Very good. And um, when do we apply lotion? Yeah, last. Yep. After we've we've washed, rinsed, dried, cleaned, and filed. Okay. Yeah, warm it in our hands. What do we do after we put it on? Wipe it off. Very good. All right. We also learned how to make an occupied bed. Um, what position should the patient be in when we're changing that sheet? On their side, but where in the bed? In the center. In the middle. Okay, so on their side, in the middle. What kind of sheet rolls toward me? What type of sheet goes away from me? Okay. Um, remain behind the patients. Yeah, behind or back or, yeah. Um, what should not be under the patient after we put the sheet on? What do I want to minimize? Wrinkles. Wrinkles. We're going to make hospital corners. You want to loosen sheet over the toes. And you want to replace the pillowcase with the opening facing away from the door. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. A lot of people walking out in that hallway, right? A lot of people with germs. Those germs may travel on things in the air currents. We don't want those to get inside the pillowcase and have a nice, warm, dark, moist place to land. So we always put the pillowcase away from the door. Okay. That way it keeps pathogens from getting inside the pillowcase. All right, range of motion. CNAs do range of motion to do what? retain function. We're not trying to build anything, We're not trying to improve anything. So when we lift an extremity, how do we lift? Okay. Supported. We lift from below with a flat palm and supporting at both or at, at all joints. Uh, Anthea says, good morning at the skills exam. When you said, wash your hands, you did it each time in every skill. Yes, Anthea, you're going to wash your hands physically, going to the sink, washing your hands until they tell you you can simulate. Don't simulate on your own. You will physically wash your hands with soap and water at the sink until they tell you you can simulate. And then when they tell you you can simulate, you're just going to say, I would wash my hands here. Okay. Um. When we're doing range of motion, we want to move smoothly and fast or slow? Slow. We always want to return to, yeah, original position, start position. Very good. Flexion extension is up and down. Abduction, adduction is side to side, yeah. And rotation is around. How do we know what exercises to do on what which patient? 
How, how do we know uh, how many repetitions? Air plan. Very good. Look at everything you've learned. I have a question about the washing rules. Uh, one of the points is use leaves method. For we haven't covered that yet. Oh, okay. We're going to get to that next week. Okay. Yep. I still have to, I've got a whole lecture on that. There's also another one in that same um, lineup. It's number 19. It says change water if cold or whatever, but there is no answer choice for that. Like on the answers on the side of the page, it doesn't even have 19 as a number. Oh, I missed one. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Caitlin, uh, make a note, uh, number, uh, review sheet number three, um, uh, soapy, add soapy, make a note, please. Okay. Thank so you. it's, it's actually on there, but it says that 20 is soapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't get the surface bed table floor. Wet. Uh, that's what yeah. I would say, but I don't think there's the word wet on here. Okay. No. All right. So uh, I'll, I'll go back and look at that. Um, you guys are the first ones that got the printed. Um, so yeah, the review sheets. So these are, are new. I just developed these. Um, thanks. Thanks. I was printing them. I was creating them, you know, during the class earlier this year, um, in January, but I just had them printed. So I'll, I'll fix that. Thank you. Any other errors that you find, please let me know. Then it said it was, or I put 19 for something, and then it said it was 20, and I was like, Duh. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, any errors that you find, please bring to my attention. I appreciate that. All right. So any questions on what we've gone over so far? Any questions? Am I going too fast for anyone? Everybody able to keep up pretty well? Okay, we use a lot of repetition in the program. And that way, um, it's continuously reinforcing these same principles that we've learned. So by the time you get to the test, you shouldn't have to think about anything, really. Because I say the same things over and over and over, and you now know the important principles that apply to these skills. Okay. But my goal doesn't have anything to do with the test. I want you to pass the test. You're going to pass the test. You're going to do fantastic. But that's not my goal. My goal is to instill these principles in you so deeply that when you get out into the workplace, it won't make any sense for you to do this any other way. And that's what's going to give our patients the best possible quality of care. Okay. Well, I, I can say too, I use it to for the CNA so the nurse note because CNA had a lot of responsibility and we think about that. Absolutely. I mean, that could be that patient's life we're talking about. Sure. So I see why, I mean, now I'm understanding more and more why it's so important and why you see, I mean, I'm thinking you're like the CNA is kind of the first line of defense for that patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. That down right, then, so that's why it's such an important position. But some people, I don't think, look at it like that. No, I don't and really, really think they help. But I tell you, like you're saying, a good CNA can make a difference between a patient enjoying their stay there, making the best of it, even though it's so difficult for them, versus not. Absolutely, absolutely. CNAs have a great responsibility there. And unfortunately, most training programs train specifically on the skills. They show you how to do hand and nail care, but they don't explain to you why these steps are important. And if you don't know the why behind it, you won't, you won't report things. You'll just go in and do what you're there to do and move on. And we're seeing that, you know, a lot of things are getting missed. And a lot of medical errors are occurring that shouldn't be occurring if somebody had just mentioned something. Or on the other hand, there's a lot of CNAs out there that um, 
implement things that they don't have any right to implement. Right. So understanding our role is super important. And I think that it's the one part of CNA training that isn't effectively um, communicated. And that's why I created this. Do you, I, I was helping an elderly leader in a neighborhood and, and people come in to help her. But what I noticed is a lot of those people come in and they would sit in her chair and be on their phone. And they were not doing the things for her that they were supposed to be doing. And I saw that more than once. Sure. I, I was there to clean and I, I tried to fix nose and things like that, but I wasn't supposed to be directly taking care of her. But there were people brought in that were. So I don't know if that, if that if her situation was just kind of unique and that... But, but it seems to me when I talk to other people that they're finding that, I mean, one good friend of mine told me that her mom was supposed to, somebody's supposed to come in and give her a bath. She found out a lot later they weren't giving her a bath. I mean, it, it, I, I just don't, I, it just blows my mind how you can go to somebody's place and sit on your phone and not take care of them. That's what you're being paid to do. Right. Well, that's unfortunately not limited to the caregiving industry. Right. No, it's not. It's not. That's, it's, 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 it's broad. It's broad yeah. Perspective. Yeah. There, there's very little um, ethics and personal responsibility being utilized in workplaces. Right. And it's unfortunate. And it's unfortunately not a, a, a anything that I have a solution for. Yeah, but it does seem to be worse when you are not properly... Um, supervised. Okay. People will get away with what they can get away with. That's human nature, right? right? If you think you can get away with something, you're probably going to try it. Um, if there's no consequence to stealing, why wouldn't you, you know? So it's in this case, they're stealing from the patient because they're not doing the proper skills. They're stealing from the workplace because they're training money for, um, not doing the things they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, effectively it is stealing, but if they're not properly supervised, if nobody is there to make sure that things are done the way they're supposed to, yeah. you're going to see more of that. And there was a problem, you know, because there wasn't an iron come in very often to check on her or as somebody that was a more higher authority. Right. Um, and a lot of hers were not through an agency. They were that, is it called care.com or something right. like that? She would hire a lot through that. Um, and so there wasn't a particular agency, but then she noticed sometimes those were better workers than the people that were working for a certain agency. So I don't know. It's just, it's really interesting. There's just a lot of, but like you're saying, it's not just healthcare. I know that. Yeah. It's it not just, not just healthcare. Yeah. I just don't know how to help them. I mean, there's surely there's something that, I don't know. It seems like, but maybe it involves a training like you're trying to do now to make a difference. I mean, that's where it all starts. Right. That's where it all starts. Yeah. But you have to have the right people with the right mindset. So here's something that a lot of, um, let me see how to, how to word this. I think that CNA should make a lot more money than they make. Okay. I think the wages are too low, but here's the problem. Okay. There's always two sides to every equation. And we're looking at, we do a lot of work. We have a lot of responsibility. We're frontline. You know, what we do matters. We should get paid better. And I absolutely 100% agree with you. CNAs are way underpaid. But here's the problem. CNA training is short. How long are you guys here for? Four weeks. Yeah, four weeks. Eight classes. Yeah, eight classes, four weeks. That's not long. You guys didn't pay a whole lot of money to get in here. I mean, yes, I know it's a lot of money. I get it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not blind to that, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, this isn't a two year, $20,000 program, right? And the people that are watching at home, they're getting this for free, right? So you don't have a lot of time and you don't have a lot of money invested in the training. Keep that in mind. Okay. So now if we start paying way more money, what you guys are worth, okay, in a low income, low time investment modality, right, who are we going to attract? Are we going to attract people that really care about the patient? Who are we going to attract? That's right. That's right. 
because CNA training is so condensed and low monetary investment, you have to be really careful about how much you attract because of that. How much do CNAs make? What range are they making? I hate answering that question because it, it's, it varies widely, widely. If you're working with a single patient in their home and not having to do a whole lot, you might be making 15, 16 an hour. If you're working in a nursing home that is trying desperately to recruit people and they're, you know, having a real hard time getting their positions filled, well, they're going to pay more because they're trying to recruit people. You might be making 22, 23. Um, hospitals generally don't pay much because everybody wants to work there. It's supply and demand. If you've got a ton of applications, why would I have to pay top dollar? People are lining up to work here. I can get them for the lowest price possible. Right? Makes sense. It's supply and demand. If you're working in a place that nobody wants to work, well, the wages are going to be higher because we have to try to recruit people. Make sense? So you have to think about... Um, where you want to work. And, and wages are going to play into it, certainly. You should never give away your time. But you also have to look at, look at some intangibles as well. And I have a whole personality quiz specifically designed to help you guys figure out where the best place for you to work is based on your personality, not based on... Um, Yeah. And, and that's the big thing. You know, a lot of half of you, if I ask right now, half of you probably want to work at the hospital. You know, it's, it's, it's the mindset, you know, the problem is the hospital is very fast paced and very clickish. Not necessarily the worst. It depends on your personality. You're going to burn out in three months when you get on the hospital. You'll be gone. You'll quit. Yeah. And, but on the other side of that equation are a lot of people that, you know, absolutely love working at the hospital because they like the variety. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on your personality. You know, how clinical are you? Do you enjoy the nursing type of skills? You know, a lot of uh, beeping and a lot of acuity and a lot of uh, different types of conditions and a lot of change, admissions and discharge. Or are you the type of person that prefers more personal care? Do you like to spend very little time with patients or a whole lot of time and get to know your patients really well, right? Very little time, walk-in clinic will be a great place for you, right? A whole lot of time, nursing homes be a great place for you or even home care. So what I did is I devised 19 questions and I ask you these questions about your personality and at the end you get a report that tells you where the best place for you to work, and then it breaks down and shows you why. Pace, it talks about opportunity for advancement, how many patients you're going to take care of, the type of patients you're going to take care of, the amount of change, the opportunity for advancement and learning new things. So all of that is detailed in this report, and it's free. Go, go to my website and take it. It's called the Workplace Personality Quiz. You'll, you, you either got a um, link for it already in one of your wrap-up emails, or you will be very shortly. Okay. So let's move on to supported sideline. This is on page 138 of your skills book. One thirty eight. Angel says, with almost every situation, why do they always place the patient on their right side? So, well, I think what you're talking about is the recovery position. And um, I don't want to say with almost every situation because that's actually not correct. There's a lot of situations where we don't want the patient on the right side. So, in, you know, in your training or experience or what you've been exposed to so far, 
you're probably talking about the recovery position and it all has to do with physiology because your heart is on the left side of your body, like right over here and your lungs surround the heart. Um, you've also got a stomach that kind of curves around here. If we lay you on your left side, your stomach and your lungs press down, remember gravity, press down onto the heart. Makes it harder for the heart to fill, right? More stuff pressing down on it. If we lay you on your right side, now the heart is kind of at the top. So we don't have as much pressure on top of the heart, which means it can beat more effectively. It can push out more blood. And this is what we call the recovery position is laying on the right side. And it just helps kind of um, in a body that's in stress, it kind of helps eliminate some of that pressure on the heart. Now, if you're pregnant, we actually want you on your left side. Um, and that's because of baby pressing down on the vena cava, which is the biggest vessel returning blood from the legs back up to the heart. Baby pressing down on that will impede blood flow back to the heart. So mamas, we like, especially in the last trimester, on their left side, especially if they're having any issues. Um, recovery position, patients that are in crisis, sometimes on their right side to help release the pressure on the heart. So every situation is going to be a little bit different. It depends on what's happening inside the body as to which side we want to put the patient on. Okay. Good. All right. So let's learn supported side lying. And if you look at uh, this page, you'll see that we're going to follow the care plan, that's skill rules. We're going to do our opening. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. We're going to use a barrier. We'll use a privacy blanket. Linen rules will apply. Scoot and roll, which means patient has to be in the middle of the bed. And we're going to do the closing. So all of that we already know. All of those principles we already have learned. So now we need to concentrate on just the skills specific steps. Okay, good. Now we've learned most of scoot and roll. We've gone over this the last class. Remember, we won't have side rails in all settings. We're going to have the patient scoot toward us before we roll them away. We'll remain behind the patient's behind. And the patient must always be in the middle of the bed. Now, I gave you most of this lecture last class a little early. Normally, I go over it here. Remember, I was looking for those slides, right? They're here. Because <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to talk to you about all that. I introduced it last class, but I explained it this one. Well, I've already explained it. So we're going to go through this very quickly. This is a review of what we learned last class. Good? Okay. All right, so our um, care plan is going to be located at the top of page 139, and our care plan tells us to position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. So that means they can't roll. We have to do it for them. And there's a really easy way to set a patient up to turn easily. You can move somebody three times your body weight with no stress on you or them as long as you know how to do it properly. We're going to go over that as well. But let's talk about restraints again. Remember, I was looking for the crib. This is it. <laughs> this is the slide I was looking for. So there's no difference between a crib with sides up and side rails with sides up. Both of them are designed to keep somebody confined that doesn't want to be confined in most cases. So just like that baby will jump over the side of the crib an adult will go over the side of a side rail. And remember that positioning rails or half rails at the top are not side rails. They don't affect the patient's ability to getting out of bed. It's the bottom rails that are considered side rails. Okay. So let's talk about immobile patients. I cut this down quite a bit so that we didn't have to go through all of those slides what I talked to you about last class. So let's talk about immobile patients. Now, immobile means they cannot move on their own. Our care plan on the top page 139 does not say our patient is immobile. It just says they can't turn on their own. 
So be careful when you're reading these care plans not to put words in there that don't belong. A lot of people read that care plan and immediately assume that patient is immobile. They're not. They just can't turn. So maybe they just had a huge open heart surgery and their abdominal muscles were all cut. They can't flip on their side. They don't have any muscles there to do that. But that doesn't mean that they're immobile, unable to move on their own. Make sense? Okay. But I do want to talk about immobility and the effects on the body because I think it's important that we understand what immobility is and how it affects the patient. So if we have a patient that's immobile, that means they cannot move on their own at all. So what kind of ADLs would we have to help somebody with that cannot move on their own? Everything. Yeah, everything. They're not going to be able to brush their own teeth. They can't move. They're not going to be able to give themselves a drink. They can't move. They're not going to be able to relieve pressure when they get uncomfortable. They can't move. They're not going to be able to take care of their own toileting, bathing, dressing, grooming, anything. So when we have an immobile patient, they're going to need help with absolutely everything. Good. Now, if they're immobile and unconscious, like our late stage dementia patients, we're going to add in a few extra things that we're going to do because they're unconscious. One of those is going to be to clean their mouth out with like little sponges. Um, it's called oral care because unconscious people will generally breathe through their mouth, which dries out the mouth. And we want to re-moisten it because without moisture, if your mouth dries out, it can actually crack, right? The skin can crack. What do cracks in the skin let in? Bacteria. Yeah, pathogens. Absolutely. And remember, that's already a doorway. So we would want to make sure that we, um, you know, clean the mouth out, keep it moist. Uh, you want to wipe the eyes to make sure that they don't get glued shut with secretions. Um, you want to turn the patient every so often. So there's additional things that we're going to do with patients that are immobile and unconscious. This is what we call total care. Total care. Would an uh, unconscious patient still need to be fed and all that? It depends on the patient, but generally speaking, if they're unconscious, they're going to receive their nutrition through IV or through a feeding tube. Yeah. When you mean unconscious, you mean like, like unaware of their surroundings, unable to interact with others. So, like in the wipe or in coma? Either. Either. The term coma actually means unaware of your surroundings and unable to interact with others. So end of life dementia, when we have somebody that is unconscious, that is technically a coma. Coma is kind of the lay person term. Okay. We tend to think of comas as something that happens when you get hit on the head. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, coma is not a, it's a lay person term. Dementia, okay, so with dementia, um, remember dementia means brain sick, brain broken, right? So what does our brain control? All functions. All functions. Remember we talked about that this morning, right? Your, your nervous system, which is your brain, spinal cords, and nerves, controls everything. So when we have a broken brain and it progresses, it will eventually affect all function, all function, seeing, hearing, talking, moving, all function. But that person is still in the know-how, like alive, just can't. We don't know. We don't know. We do not know how much they're able to process. We don't know. We want to proceed as if they can hear everything we do and say. 
but we don't know. Okay, make sense? So somebody that is unconscious and unable to move on their own is what we call total care. Somebody that is unable to move on their own but conscious can often tell us what they need. But somebody that is unconscious cannot. That's the difference. Okay. So when we have an immobile patient, um, this is going to affect every single organ in the body. Every organ. And we kind of went over this a little bit earlier. It's going to affect the lung volume. It's going to affect the nerves and the brain function. It's going to um, affect digestion, the ability of food to move through the digestive system. It's going to affect your urinary system. It's going to affect your lymphatic system. It's going to affect every system of your body. This is why we don't want to restrict patients to bed whenever possible. We don't want to make them immobile because everything gets affected. Your bone density even decreases when you're immobile. I mean, everything is affected. But one of the biggest areas that's affected is the skin, the integumentary system. And I want to talk about that in, um, in detail because that's why we're doing this particular skill. So in order to understand how this works, I want you to take one hand and put it underneath your leg. And I want you to sit on it for the next two minutes. Now, you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to want to pull that hand out. Please don't. Please just play along. I promise I won't make you do this for more than two minutes. Okay. But when we have immobility, when we, were, when, blah, when we are unable to move on our own, um, we have to understand the effect of gravity. So the bones in our body are hard, right? They're, they're, they're bones. They're hard. Well, gravity is going to pull all of that down toward the center of the earth. So right now, your leg bones are pressing down into the muscle, which is pressing down into the skin, which is now pressing down onto your hand, right? So everything is being pulled downward because of gravity. Well, any areas that are underneath bone are going to receive more pressure. So this can be the back of your head, your shoulder blades, your lower back, your hips, the back of your thighs, the back of your calves, your heels, right? Any area where gravity is pulling down on top of bones. And what this does, this pressure is it actually, it compresses everything underneath that bone. And what's between your muscle and your skin are blood vessels. So those blood vessels actually get squished. So what do you think happens when we don't get good blood flow to an area. Yeah, it, it, it starts to have effects. And eventually, if we don't fix that, that area will die. So this is what happens, right? We have um, blood vessels that get compressed, and now they're not able to distribute blood. This happens to you guys every night when you're sleeping. You move. You stretch you twitch, you reposition. And that's because your brain is like, hey, that area isn't getting good blood flow. It's starting to hurt, which is the signal you need to move. So you toss and you turn, right? Well, anything on under you, wrinkles, are you getting uncomfortable yet? <laughs> wrinkles are going to press up. So you've got pressure coming down and pressure coming up. And those blood vessels get caught right in the middle. And then we end up with problems. So pull your hand out for a second and take a look at it. Do you have color changes? Right? Look closely. Can you see the pattern of the chair or your, um, your clothing embedded in that skin? Guys, that was only two minutes. Two minutes. On it for a while. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That was only two minutes. And you guys wanted to pull your hands out before I let you. And that was only two minutes. Imagine 
putting somebody that can't move on their own in the same position and leaving them there for hours. How uncomfortable would they be? Okay, and now add to that the fact that you guys had skin changes after just two minutes. How deep do you think those creases are going to get over hours? So that's what happens exactly. Those creases embed into the skin deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper because gravity is pulling everything down deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually it will cut into the skin. And that is called a pressure sore or a bed sore or a decubitus ulcer. Very hard because we don't have blood flow. We've compressed those blood vessels and killed them. So if we have no good blood flow, how do we get healing nutrients to the area? Now, if you add that onto, okay, the fact that this is usually on an older patient that already has a decreased heart um, function, decreased blood vessel um, strength, decreased nutrition, that's going to be really hard to heal. Make sense? That is where the observation comes in from seeing it to let the nurse know so it don't get worse. Right, it's right. Really stages. So if we see redness, what do we do? Let the nurse know. We're also going to turn our patients on a schedule if they cannot move on their own. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So here we're talking about patient not having pressure weight on a, a part of the body, but I've seen a lot of those heavy blankets that people usually buy to cover themselves. That if you're not, you know, a patient, so is that also not healthy to have or good to have? Well, the um, the weighted blankets, um, they don't. How do I put this? The reason that you're going to have skin breakdown underneath, okay, so like your leg where it's hitting the, the chair is because you have bone inside that's pressing down. So you've got something hard pressing down onto that surface. The weighted blankets, they are heavy, but there's nothing solid pressing down in one area. Now, I'm going to change that just a little bit. Let's say we have a patient laying down, a weighted blanket on top of them. Remember, that weight is now contributing. So where would they be more at risk to see effects? On top of the skin or on the bottom? Because it's more weight pressing in. So if we're going to use a weighted blanket, we need to be looking even harder at the skin underneath, right? Whatever's contacting the bed. So also most of the areas that has the bone, like the elbow, the heel, because it have that bone there, it caused that area to break down even faster because it's more where the bony areas are. Right. And less tissue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Less tissue. So how often do they usually train those patients? Like every two hours? Or so it depends on the patient. Yeah. Okay. But our standard is every two hours around the clock. We're going to get to that in just a second every two hours around the clock. But there are some situations where as the RN writing the care plan, I may have you changing the patient's position every hour around the clock, depending on the needs of the patient. If I've got an end stage, uh, terminally ill patient that is in the dying process and unable to turn on their own, and they're not eating, so they have no protein intake, because we need protein to keep our muscles intact, and our skin intact. So if we have somebody with no protein intake, unconscious, I may have you change them every hour around the clock. So how would we know which one we need for this patient? The care plan. The care plan. Very good. Okay, so um, let's go here. Remember, this change only occurred in two minutes. Imagine if you left your hand there for hours. 
This is why you change position frequently when you're sleeping. You don't go to sleep and then wake up exactly in that position. You're constantly moving. But it's not just sleeping. In here, in right here, you guys are all moving around. Yes, you're sitting, but you're still moving. Like you're, you know, moving your foot, you're stretching your leg, you just repositioned your body. You guys are all moving even though you're sitting. Why are you doing that? Hurting, you're going to sleep. And That's right. Things start going situation. to sleep. They start hurting because of diminished blood flow. Yeah, we used to call it fidgety. It's actually important. You need to be fidgety. Somebody that's not being fidgety is at risk of, of skin breakdown. So fidgety is good. Okay. But what if your patient can't fidget? They're going to get uncomfortable. Whether they are able to recognize it or not. So what about um, massaging? Is it, I would think that would be important too, just as important as turning them to massage their body. Right, to wake up the blood vessels, yeah. promote circulation. And we're actually going to do that with partial bed bath. We're going to give a brief back rub. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, very good. Massaging used to be a very important part of what CNAs did, but then for some reason, massages kind of got um, taken over and, and sexualized and, um, you know, so CNAs just kind of felt it wasn't really important to what they do, but it actually is. Massaging is just, I'm not talking about deep tissue. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about just, uh, you know, a light touch, but it wakes up the nerve endings, it promotes circulation, and it just overall leads to a better feeling of uh, being cared about. Okay. So patients that cannot move on their own must be turned at least every two hours around the clock or as often as directed in the care plan. And the way we do this is we start out with the patient on their back. Then we turn them on their right side, then back to their back. Then on their left side, then back to their back. Then right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back, until they can start moving on their own or whatever. Um, notice not, nowhere on here does it say stomach. Do not place an immobile patient on their stomach. Um, you have to have a certain amount of strength to lift yourself off of your chest cavity for your lungs to inflate. Remember, gravity is pulling everything down. So if we place somebody on their stomach and gravity is pulling all of their body weight down, it can actually keep your lungs from being able to inflate properly. We do not put patients on their stomach unless the care plan specifically tells us to do so. What position should you not put an infant on when they're sleeping? Yeah, same reason. No, we used to do that years back. Absolutely. Because then they thought if they had stood up, then it could just... Right. They were afraid of aspiration. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. But we learn as, you know, as we investigate things and we um, gain greater understanding, we adapt our methods. That's actually the first time I've ever heard of dogs. Really? Yeah. Yeah. For babies or for dogs? Babies. For infants, it's best to have them sleeping on their back. Or even if you take a, a, a like a receiving blanket and kind of make a roll and put it under one side of them just to kind of put them on their side just a little bit, um, you can do that as well if, if the infant is a little bit more comfortable with that. But generally speaking, we do not recommend putting infants, and I'm talking about anybody under three months old, right, right, on their stomach to sleep. Sudden well, they still have sudden infant death syndrome. We don't know what causes it in most cases, um, but they kind of felt that this might be contributing to it, and that's why they made this new recommendation. It's not new, new. But, but I think in some other countries they've been doing that for a long time, right? Maybe not. I guess I thought I'd been impression that in some other countries for a long time they've been doing that, and then in the United States we kind of adopted that. But maybe I don't. I don't know the etymology of that okay. of that recommendation. Okay. It's not something that I've studied. Yeah, so it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, 
well, you know, as a society, we're still learning. We don't have it all figured out yet. Yeah. And like with my daughter elevating that head of her cred, that made all the difference in the world sure. for her. And it's just little things, little things like that. If like that can help prevent them, the sick thing, you know, dying. It's just amazing. I mean, but you know, it can't always, because like you said, they don't know exactly what causes it. Right. If, if we don't know what is causing it, it's hard to come up with a strategy to prevent it. Right. Right. So medicine is still a practice. Mm -hmm. It's not a, we, we don't have all the answers. We're still just trying to figure things out as we go. It's like the economy. Anybody notice prices are up? <laughs> right. We don't have it all figured out, right? We'd like to think we do. You know, 10 years ago, the economy was clipping along pretty good. But we don't have all the answers for anything, for housing, yeah, for true. population, for climate, for economy, and certainly not for medicine. Um, a lot of people think we do. A lot of people think that, you know, we know everything and we can fix anything. And that is absolutely not the case. We're still learning. And sometimes they'll say, well, you should do this. And then they come back through with this. No, you shouldn't. And then they come back and say, oh, yeah, you can now. I mean, it's it's always constantly changing. Right. Because of new information. Mm -hmm. Yep. And all they can do is make recommendations based right. on the information they have. Right. So when we're turning patients, it's going to be back, right, back, left, back, right. And you may even have a turning clock like this on the wall. It's just, you know, a piece of paper printed out. So if I walk in the patient's um, room at 1 p.m., I can look at this and see the patient should be on their right side. Right. At 2 o'clock, we're going to turn them on to their back. So these turning clocks can be used in the room so you can see at any time where the patient should be. And it keeps everybody on the same page. If you don't have a turning clock in the room and you're working with an immobile patient, you can certainly make one. That is within the, the CNA purview. You can make a turning clock so everybody's on the same page. And it also makes sure it, it's kind of a checks and balances thing to make sure that this is actually getting done. Okay. So you can, you can make a turning clock. There's no problem with that. Um, but unless the care plan specifically tells us to, we don't put them on their stomach. stomach. That could be a written test question. That's something you need to know unless the care plan tells us otherwise. Now, I will tell you that during COVID, when we had patients on ventilators, we actually found that putting them on their stomach gave us much better ventilation rates. Um, and that's because the fluid would then flow. It's all about fluid management. The fluid would flow to the very front of the lungs, leaving the back or working area of the lungs more able to exchange gas. So those patients, the turning clocks actually had us putting them prone. So where would that be found? And the care plan. Are you guys seeing how important that care plan is? Because there is no two situations exactly alike. So prone is stomach and what's the other one? Supine. Supine. Okay. Yeah, chapter nine is going to go into that mm -hmm. in, in your homework reading. Chapter nine mm -hmm. is going to go into the different positions. But the way I remember it is prone, posterior up. Okay. Supine on your spine. Mm -hmm. Lateral is you know, lying on your side. Um, Fowler's is head of the bed elevated or the position you need to be in to eat fried chicken. Fowl chicken. Okay. Um, so you'll learn those uh, positions in chapter nine. All right. So if we're going to turn a patient onto their side because our turning clock tells us to, then um, we have to make sure that after the turn, they're in the center, center of the bed. That means that we're going to scoot them toward us first, position them properly, and then turn them so that after the turn, they're in the middle of the bed. Make sense? Now, how you scoot them towards you can 
most likely be on the care plan. The test isn't going to tell us what to do here um, because the test says that the patient is unable to turn. Did the care plan say they were immobile? No. no. So we can ask the patient, can you scoot toward me? Remember, don't read anything into the care plan that's not actually there. Okay. So for the test, we're just going to ask them, can you scoot your body toward me, please? Okay. So after they've turned, they should not be on the edge of the bed. Even if I put a side rail here, do you think that patient is comfortable pressed up against the side rail? No, no. no because they're aware if that side rail fa fails, where am I going to be? On the floor. So our goal here is to keep the patient in the middle of the bed. So we'll scoot them toward us so that they're in the middle after the turn, and then we're going to roll them into the side facing away from us. Um, if you can't, if they can't scoot towards you on, on their own, you can use a draw sheet, which is a flat sheet under the patient like this that we would use as a um, sling to move their body weight toward us. And then this draw sheet just gets tucked underneath the mattress because nothing should touch the floor. Okay. When you're using a draw sheet, the folded edge should always be up between the shoulders. The two free edges, see how those free edges are? Those should be down under the thighs. So folded edge always under the shoulders. It's going to have less pressure there. Remember, pressure is going to be important. Good. You can also use them in segments, use a slide sheet. But this is how we position our patient. If I'm going to turn a patient onto their side, I've got to position them properly before that. So I'm going to scoot them toward me. And then they have four extremities. I'm going to position all four. The furthest arm goes over or up here, like over their head. Closest arm crosses their chest. So if I'm turning the patient onto their left side, I'm always going to turn them away from me. So I'm over here. Furthest arm up closest arm crosses. If I were to turn them on their right side, I would be over here, furthest arm up, closest arm crosses. Okay, good. Now we're going to move on to the legs. The closest knee is going to be bent with a foot flat on the bed. Okay. The furthest knee is going to be angled out. And if we get the patient in this position, when we go to turn them, it is super simple. Super simple. It doesn't take any effort on your part or theirs. Okay? So, furthest arm up, closest arm crosses, closest knee bent, foot flat on the bed, furthest knee angled. Good? So let me get somebody. Actually, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> no, no. It's because you uh, you struggled with this last weekend. So I want you to, to feel this from the patient's point of view. So if I can get you to lay down in the bed for me, I'm not going to go through the whole opening and all that. I'm just going to show you the actual um, positioning and turning. And then I'll show you the whole skill from beginning to end in a minute. But let me just show you the positioning and the turning. So I'm going to turn this a little bit here. There we go. All right. So again, she um, positioned herself in the middle of the bed. All by herself. I didn't ask her to do that. She did it. And in a clinical setting, she would be covered by a sheet. I'm going to move that sheet out of the way and put a privacy blanket on to protect her privacy, but give me access to everywhere that I need to, um, to work. Okay. So scoot your whole body a little bit closer to me, please. All right. So if I were to turn her onto her side, I need to position her properly first. So the first arm is going to be bent and go up over her head. Closest arm is going to cross her chest. Closest knee is going to be bent with the foot on the bed. Furthest knee is going to be angled out. So now as she relaxes, you can see she's already half on her side without me having to do any work here. So then I just put a hand on the hip and the shoulder. Now she's not going to help me. She's just going to lay there. I'm going to do this myself, but you can see just how easy this is. 
You guys see that? Do you see that? <laughs> okay. Now, I'm looking at her. She does seem to be just a little bit too close to the edge of the bed for my comfort. Yeah. So in a clinical setting, I would bring her back. I'm going to scoot her a little bit closer to me so that after the turn, when I am no longer in the room, she is not near the edge of the bed. Thank you very much. Is there a way that you could leave, just leave the sheet like the cover blanket? I mean yeah, you can. There, there's no problem with that. You can leave the sheet on the bed and work around it. I don't because when I turn the patient, that sheet's going to get all tangled up in their legs. And you'll see this when you actually do that. I want you to do this twice, once with a blanket and once just with the top sheet. And you'll actually see that even though it's an extra step and an extra supply, it actually is easier not to be tangled up in that sheet. But you can do it either way. As long as the patient is covered, okay. as long as the patient is covered during the skill, they don't care how the covered happens. Okay? They don't care how the covered happens. Well, doing that positioning, would that have worked with my MS patient? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Can you put something maybe on the back side of it so they don't roll back over? We're, yeah, we're going to use some. Uh, I haven't got that to there yet. <laughs> but yes, because so gravity is going to pull her back onto her back. Gravity always will pull you back onto your back. So we're going to use some pillows to keep her in that position. We're also going to put some pillows between her legs so those knees and ankles don't rub together and we end up with that pressure problem. We're going to put a pillow under her top arm to get it in a normal uh, position to relieve stress along the neck and, and upper back. So we're going to use some pillows to um, keep her in that position. So yes, what I just showed you is only a small part of the skill, but I definitely wanted you to understand that just because you had such a hard time last week and I wanted you to see it from the patient's point of view. I can't give you an answer that's going to cover absolutely every scenario because patients are different, right? And it depends on how many contractures they have, the state of their muscles, but that's where the nurse's input is going to be valuable to you. So there, the nurse knows this, and then the nurse can modify this based on the needs of the patient and train you and what needs to be done. I know it's an imperfect system. I know I'm telling you how it should be, and it's not always done that way. Yeah. Someone opened their home to assisted living patients, and one of the people was quadriplegic, and she could not move a limb at all. Right. So, and having, like I said, to push and pull her to do her backside put strain on my shoulder. So, I'm wondering if that would have helped me. It should have. Yes. It should have. Yeah. Yeah. So this is how we're going to do this particular skill. So here's our position that we just did. Okay. Furthest arm up, closest arm crosses the chest, closest knee bent with foot on the bed, furthest knee angled out. Exactly the way these words are exactly the way that I demonstrated it. Okay. I use the same words over and over because I know this is a little complex. We're then going to roll the patient to the middle of the bed. And we want that upper knee kind of bent in front of the lower knee, you know, so they're not like laying right on top of each other. And we're going to put a pillow but behind the back, pillow between the legs, and a pillow under the top arm. And we also want to adjust the pillow under the head. Because when we turn them, chances are their shoulder is going to be on that pillow. Scrunches up that shoulder can lead to muscle tension headaches. So we want that pillow, we're going to kind of move it out of the way and just put it under the head and neck, not under the shoulder. Where do you think the call light should go? Okay. Well, in this case, I don't really have a stronger or a weaker arm, but it definitely has to be in their hand. Okay. Not laying on the bed behind them, in their hand. And ideally, in the bottom hand, because you don't want that cord right across their neck. Okay. Make sense? Good. Any questions on this? All right. So let's look at that care plan on page 139 one more time. 
at the top of the page. Um, and I don't have it with me here. Let me see here. Position. That's you don't have to turn it. Position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. That's our care plan. This is how we're going to do that. Okay. So I'm going to show you the video for this. It's going to show you how to place the pillows. And the reason I want to show you the video is because it's got good camera angle close-ups and that, that pillow behind the back is a little bit tricky. So if I show you that here, you're not going to be able to see it really well. Okay. Good. Let me show you this one and then we'll take a break. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to turn you on to your left side. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. I'll start gathering your supplies. We'll start with a barrier, which I'll place on the table to provide a clean area to place my supplies. And I'll get three pillows from clean supply cabinet, being careful not to allow them to touch my uniform. Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this blanket over you, and this will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this skill. Once I have the blanket in place, then I'll pull the sheet down underneath the blanket, making sure the patient remains covered at all times. Okay, Mr. Jones, if I could have you scoot toward me, please. Okay. I'm going to place your furthest arm above your head and cross your closest arm over your chest. I'm going to bend the closest knee and put the foot flat on the bed. And I'm going to angle the furthest knee out a little bit. Now I'm going to turn you onto your side. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to take the first pillow and put it in an angle up against the back, and I'm going to tuck this top edge underneath the patient by pushing down on the pillow and under his back. This edge will roll up, and then it too will be pushed down and under forming a roll along the back. Okay, now I'm going to position a pillow between the two legs by lifting the top leg and laying the pillow lengthwise between the two legs, specifically between the knees and the ankles, to prevent those bony areas from rubbing together. This pillow is going to be placed underneath the upper arm. This will help keep the arm in a neutral position as the patient remains on their side. And then I'm going to adjust the pillow underneath the head to make sure that it's not under the shoulder and it remains only under the head and the neck. And then move the arm to a more comfortable position. Is that comfortable, Mr. Jones? Yes. Okay, I'm going to place the call light directly in your hand. Are you comfortable? And it should be the lower hand. Can I get you anything else That's a change. Here? No. Okay, let me pull your sheet up. And remove the privacy blanket. Being careful not to dislodge all of those pillows as I do so. I'll roll the privacy blanket up and place it in dirty linen. The 
barrier will be thrown away. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to open your privacy curtain now. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, I'll see you soon. Let me go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review all the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, Apollo got certified last Saturday, thanks to this channel. Congratulations. All right, let's go ahead and take our break. Come back in 15 minutes or 20 after. Come back at 20 after and um, we will go over the rest of the skills. We have a long way to go here.
Hey, you're back. 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 Mm -hmm. My kids had spring break this week, so mm -hmm. dad was in today. We just wanted to watch them, so I had to divide all four of them up between friends' houses. Wow. Did you go four different places to get them taken here, too? Yeah. And, and that's why I was like, Aww, you're so sweet. That's a great You're great. Really you have time to stay in practice today? Yeah, we're going to stay. I'm going to sleep a little bit, and maybe a little bit. And I can only sleep a little bit, so that might be good because I think she wants to stay longer. Okay. So that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Good practice. Okay, we're going to come back just a little bit early from break today because I got so much to tell you. Well, we already did that one. Okay, so let's move on to foot care. This is going to be on page 118 of your skills book. Congratulations, Apollo. Yay. Okay. And uh, Angel says the ulcers can possibly lead to amputation, correct? Yes, Angel. Um, decubitus ulcers are pressure sores on the extremities. Um, often have a hard time being healed, so they can contribute to amputations particularly if the patient has diabetes. And we're going to be talking about that now. We're going to go over diabetes. So a lot to cover. Um, this is foot care. The principles involved in this are, of course, skill rules, because we always follow the care plan. plan. We're going to do our opening. We'll evaluate if we need gloves. We're going to use a barrier. We uh, need to follow linen rules. This is a washing skill, so all washing rules apply. We're going to clean the basin the way we clean everything else. And um, we're going to do the closing. So we need to learn skill-specific things with this. Um, no new principles to learn here. So if you go to page 119, we can take a look at the care plan at the top of the page. And it says provide foot care to one foot using soap and water. The resident is sitting in a chair uh, and their sock and shoe should be replaced at the end of the scale. Let me explain to you why the care plan says this uh, for the test. If you look at the bottom page 118, you'll see this is gonna be done on a live testing student. So any one of you might be a patient for foot care. Um, you're, you're, you know, you're going to the test with socks and shoes on, right? But at the end of this skill, there are no clean, so you're not taking clean socks to the testing center with you. So there are no clean socks to put on the patient. So it's just going to tell for the care plan for the test, tell the person performing the skill to just put the sock and shoe back on that they came with. Now in a clinical setting, of course, if you wash the foot, rinse the foot and dry the foot, we probably ought to put some clean socks on the clean foot. But for the test, there are no clean socks. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. So this is a very easy skill. It's very similar to hand and nail care, which we've already learned. Remember with hand care, we put the hand in the basin, took it out onto a towel to wash, put it back into rinse, took it out to dry, cleaned under the, under the nails, filed the rough edges, and then uh, applied lotion. Or I'm sorry, um, yeah, filed the rough edges and applied lotion. So foot care is very, very similar. We're going to put the foot in the basin to soak, take it out and put it on a towel to wash, put it back into rinse, take it out and put it on a towel to dry. All of that is the same. What's different is we're not doing anything with toenails. We're not cleaning them. We're not filing them. We're not doing anything with toenails other than looking at them. Every facility has a podiatrist that comes in. 
and sees patients that need to be seen. But the podiatrist doesn't go room to room looking for victims. He doesn't say, do you need me? Do you need me? Do you, I'm here. Do you need me? It doesn't work like that. What happens is the CNA does foot care, usually once a week, observes for any abnormalities, notifies the nurse, and then the nurse puts the patient on the podiatry list. When the podiatrist comes in, they get seen. Okay. So if you're not doing foot care or if you're doing foot care and not making observations or you make observations and you don't report them to the nurse, nothing gets done. So we don't trim toenails. We don't file toenails. We don't grind toenails. We don't clean under toenail. We don't do anything with toenails other than look at them. Okay, good. So... Not much new stuff to learn with this skill. You already know the mechanics of the skill, although I will show it to you. But in order to understand why we're doing foot care, we have to talk a little bit about diabetes. Just a little bit. Guys, diabetes is way more complex than I'm about to make it out. I'm giving you a fifth grade version of diabetes. I need you to understand that I'm oversimplifying this. Okay? So. Every cell in the body needs fuel to run. Like my car isn't going to go far if I don't put gas in it. It needs fuel to run. Every cell in your body is the same way. And the most um, efficient fuel is glucose, sugar. So when we eat carbs, carbs break down into sugar. That sugar enters the cells and provides a fuel source for the cells. Our society, carbs get a really bad rap. They do. Uh, you know, in our society, we don't like carbs. We make them out to be villains, but they're not. Carbs are actually something that your body needs because it provides fuel for your cells. Carbs in excess are bad. Any carbs that we don't use, right, from our bloodstream, any carbs that we don't use, your body is going to pack it away in a box called glycogen and shove it in a storage unit called a fat cell. And that way, if we ever need it later, we can go to that storage unit, get the box, unpack it, and we've got glucose to work with, okay? So any carbs we don't utilize get stored in our fat cells. But we need carbs for our cells to function appropriately. Make sense? Good? Okay. So... <clears throat> I got to get up for this part. All right. So you're, uh, you eat carbs. Those carbs break down into sugar. The sugar enters the bloodstream and that sugar has to go into the cells. But there is a, a part here that's missing because the sugars can't just get into the cells all by themselves. The cells are locked. What we need is a key to open the cells. So when you eat carbs and they break down into sugar and the sugar goes into the bloodstream, the brain says, hey, key factory, we need some keys. So your pancreas produces insulin, which is the key. So insulin opens the cell. The sugar enters the cell. And now it has fuel to perform the processes that it needs to perform. Okay. Now, this is in a lot of ways why we get hungry. Your cells get empty. They need fuel. They tell the brain, hey, we need some fuel. Your brain says, okay, we are hungry. Let's go find some fuel. So you eat. And most of what we crave are carbs, right? Because the cell is hungry. So you go eat some carbs. It breaks down into sugar. Your body produces insulin. Insulin unlocks the cell. The sugar is able to enter the cell and life is grand. That is a normally functioning metabolic system, okay? That is normal function. The problem is that with diabetes, this is not normal. What we're missing here is the key. So your cell is starving, tells the brain. The brain says, hey, we're hungry. You crave carbs. You eat carbs, breaks down into sugar. That goes into the bloodstream, but it can't get into the cell. So the cell is still 
starving. So your cell is telling your brain, hey, still hungry. Let's go. Need help. So you eat more carbs and those break down into sugar, but they still can't get into the cell and the cell is still starving. starving. And at this point, it's now like dying. So things are critical. Anybody know any diabetics? What do they crave? Sugar. 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 That's right. They're craving sugar because their cells are? Dying. Yeah, absolutely. This is not something to shame them over. And yet we do it all the time. You're diabetic. You know you shouldn't eat sugar. What are you thinking? Right? We shame them all the time. They are responding to a very real emergency in their body. Their cells are actively dying. What their brain doesn't understand is it's not a food problem. It's an insulin problem. Okay. They can eat all the Snickers bars in the world. It's not going to help because that sugar isn't going where it needs to go. Well, there is a solution we're going to get to in just a minute. Okay. There is a solution. But let's talk a little bit about what all this excess sugar is doing in the body because that's the real problem here. So if we have sugar that's in the bloodstream that can't get into the cells and then we just keep dumping more sugar in thinking that's going to solve the problem, that sugar has to go somewhere. And the real problem is that that sugar can't be excreted. It doesn't go out through your skin. It's really hard to pee out. So it stays in the bloodstream. So that's where our problems come in. And we call it high blood sugar levels. Anybody ever hear that term? High blood sugar? That means the sugar is in the? High range. High range, but where is it at? In the bloodstream. It's not in the cells where it needs to be. High blood sugar. Good? Okay, but on planet Earth, we have this thing called? Gravity, or as my um, granddaughter used to call it, gravity, gravity. So we have gravity. In our body, get my little props here. <laughs> so in our body, we have this blood vessel system, all these arteries, right? So if we have high blood sugar, we got a lot of sugar going around this system and we can't get rid of it. It's stuck there. It can go into the cells or it can circulate. But this is sugar and sugar is a crystal. Looks like this. If I were to blow up sugar molecules, this is what it would look like. They're crystals. These are sharp, jagged things. Okay. So these crystals coat the inside of all of these blood vessels. And because we have gravity on planet Earth, these crystals are heavy. They're going to get pulled down. So what's the lowest point of our lower body? What's the lowest point of our upper body? Hands. So diabetics are going to have problems with hands and feet. So we have hand and nail care and foot care. This is why we have to do these two skills. Because we will see the effects in the hands and the feet. Now, it'll affect other blood vessels as well, particularly small ones like the eyes and the kidneys but we're going to see a lot of the effects in the hands and the feet. Now, these are crystals, sharp, jagged things. So as these crystals start to accumulate in our blood vessels, we end up with some problems, okay? So this is a healthy blood vessel, healthy. This is what we're born with. I wish my blood vessels looked like this again. It doesn't. Healthy. But over time, our American diet doesn't keep them like this because our American diet is very carb heavy. And guys, this effect actually starts early in life. 
People don't generally wake up at 60 and go, oh my gosh, I'm diabetic. It happened last night. Okay. Diabetes happens because of our dietary choices since birth. So let me explain. We have a three-year-old. It gets up at seven o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. Mom's not quite ready to get moving quite that early. So mom goes out, lays on the couch, turns on TV for the kid, hands him a Pop-Tart, keep him quiet while she kind of naps on the couch a little bit until a more civilized hour, right? And then mom, that Pop-Tart is carbs that break down into sugar and go into the bloodstream. Mom gets up 7, 7.30, gives the kid a bowl of cereal. Now cereal for kids isn't like all brand, is it? What are we eating as kids? Sugar, yeah, Fruity Pebbles, Captain Crunch. Yeah, all the good stuff, right? Those are all carbs that break down into sugar and get dumped into the bloodstream. Now, every time we dump sugar into the bloodstream, that pancreas has to produce insulin. So Pop-Tart, sugar in the bloodstream, pancreas produces insulin. Uh, Captain Crunch, sugar in the bloodstream, pancreas produces insulin. So uh, mid-morning snack, mom's good mom, gives child fruit. Fruit is sugar that goes into the bloodstream and the um, pancreas has to produce insulin. Lunch, national toddler diet, chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, which is predominantly carbs, which break down into sugar and makes the pancreas produce insulin. Then we have an afternoon snack, little Debbie something. So that is sugar which breaks down into carbs, which makes the body produce insulin. Dinner, buttered spaghetti, which are carbs, right? This is a normal diet. And then before bed, we give them a dessert, which is sugar that breaks down into, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> carbs that break down into sugar that produces insulin by the pancreas. So we keep this, um, this nutrition process going throughout our lives. We become teenagers and we live on pizza and French fries and Taco Bell. We become young adults and we have no money. So we eat a lot of Raymond and mac and cheese, right? So these are all carbs that make our pancreas work and work and work and work. And by the time we're 60, our pancreas is like done, checking out. You've used me up. There's nothing left to give here. And this is how our older individuals end up developing diabetes later in life. And they'll say, well, I never had that before. It's not a sudden problem. It is a problem that has been built up, building up throughout their entire life because of the dietary choices that they've made. Okay, we're going to get to that in just one second. Okay. So we're going to get to that. So we start out life with our blood vessels that look like this. But after a few years of this American diet, our blood vessels start to look a little more like this. Now, there's not a whole lot of difference here, right? But if you look close, you can see the diameter is a little smaller. Okay, a little smaller. We're getting a little buildup in here. Now, what's moving through this? blood. And when we take a blood pressure, we are evaluating how much pressure is inside this artery when a wave moves through and in between waves. Well, if some of our diameter has been taken up, that means the pressure in here is always a little bit higher. So our diabetic patients generally have higher blood pressure. Now, if we don't change our ways and we continue this eating process, we end up in middle age looking something like this. Now, we've lost about a quarter of our diameter. That means that we're not going to be able to get good blood flow to areas that need it. So wounds may not heal as quickly. Uh, we may not be able to tolerate exercise as well. Starting to see that? Good. Now, by the time we realize that we've passed the point of no return, our arteries look like this. 
This blood isn't able to move effectively through this. It's slowing down. And anytime blood slows or stops, it clots, which is what you see here. So what are diabetic patients at risk of? Blood clots. If it happens in the brain, it's a stroke. If it happens in the heart, it's a heart attack. If it happens anywhere else in the body, it's a blood clot. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys starting to see the problem here? Okay. This isn't a sudden, oh my gosh, I'm 60. I've got diabetes now. When did that happen? It's happened throughout your life. Now, let's go back here. Let me go back. Okay, let's go back here real quick, right? So we need a key to open this cell. That key is called insulin, and it's made in our body by our pancreas. Now, over time, when we overuse our pancreas, sometimes it just plain gives out. It says, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. That's diabetes. But sometimes it kind of gets the work orders wrong and it starts making car keys when we need house keys. Like it's still making keys, but it's not making the right kind of keys. Those keys aren't really opening the door of the cell. Does that make sense? Still making insulin, but not really effective insulin. We call that insulin resistance. Okay. Pancreas is still working, still producing insulin, but it's just not the right kind. It's missing a few things that it needs. Good? Make sense? All right, but it, it, it goes beyond that. <laughs> that was bad enough. Okay, that's bad enough. But these sugar crystals don't just affect the inside of the arteries. They also coat the nerves themselves. So it kind of looks like this. This is a, a power line like up north with ice on it. And when you have this, sometimes the electricity can't get through and we get brownouts and blackouts because the electricity just can't travel through that. So this is what happens in the body with diabetes. You can end up with your nerves actually covered by these crystals and it affects the ability of a signal to travel from one place to another. So I might stub my toe and my toe knows that there's an injury there, but we're hardwired, right? There, there's actual nerves that connect all of this. That nerve in my foot can't transmit that signal up to my brain. So even though my toe knows there's a problem, my brain has no clue because the signal can't travel. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Okay, so putting all this together, when we have a diabetic patient, we're going to have decreased healing. We're going to have decreased feeling. We're going to have decreased blood flow. We're going to have higher blood pressure. And we're going to have cells that are always feeling like they're starving. So this is, a, this is a horrible mess to deal with. So one of the things that we can do to help out here is we can't really do much about the whole insulin problem unless we're giving the patient pills or insulin, right? That's a nursing problem. But if we have a diabetic patient who's eating M&Ms or Snickers bars or donuts or whatever, if we can get them to eat a little protein with it, because every cell has a back door. Now we can't do anything about the front door, but that back door is opened by protein. That's not as efficient, doesn't work quite as well, but it does work. So what that does is if the patient eats some protein with those carbs, then some of the sugar can get into the cell, not as efficient, but it quiets the cell down. They're getting fed. So we end up with fewer cravings. So instead of the patient eating a handful of M&Ms, try to get them uh, a half of a peanut butter sandwich 
right? Because we have carbs and peanut butter, which peanut butter is protein. Or apples and cheese. Or, um, I don't know, tuna and crackers, right? So if we can pair a protein with that carb that they're going to eat, then we can help reduce those cravings and reduce ultimately the amount of sugar that's inside that arterial system, not doing anybody any good. I've seen a lot of fiber supplements in the pairs of plants. How does fiber play into insulin? So remember I said that we can't excrete uh, excess sugar very well. Fiber has been shown to help with binding the sugar up and I'll be a little bit more proactive at, at excreting it through the digestive system. It's not as efficient as we would like. It's kind of a little, it's a Band-Aid and, you know, Band-Aid solution, but it, it has been shown to have some effect. Okay. It does a few other things. I'm just trying to bring this down to like a fifth grade level. Okay. But it can't, it has been shown to kind of help bind some of that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Good. Makes sense. So let me tell you a story about why this is important. This is a true story. We're going to call the guy Henry. Okay. Many, many years ago, I was an agency nurse, which is a substitute nurse, not my facility. I don't work there, but they hire me to come in when they don't have any of their normal nurses, their regular staff nurses available. So I went in and I was working on the rehab side this particular day. Again, not my facility. And I go in and I get report and start visiting my patients and I've got to do my assessments. So I go in and um, see a couple patients and I get to this room and as I enter the room, the light is off. He's got one small light right above his bed, but the main light in the room is off. And as I go in, I flip the light on because I got to do an assessment. And as I flip the light on, he starts screaming, turn it off, turn it off. So I turn the light off and walk up to the bed and I said, hey, Henry, my name is Patty. I'm your nurse today. Um, any particular reason we don't want the light on today? What's going on? I think it maybe he has a headache or something. I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know him. He's not my patient. He says, no, no, I have diabetic retinopathy and the bright lights hurt my eyes. And I said, oh, okay, no problem. No worries. And as I'm talking to him, I've got a cup of pills in my hand I'm going to give him. And I'm kind of gauging his um, mental status and gathering information, just doing a general assessment. And um, as I'm standing there, I catch an odor. Now, if you've ever smelled a wound, they're very distinctive, okay? And I'm smelling a wound. Now, as we're standing there, I pull my report sheet out of my pocket, and I'm looking, and there's nothing on there about wound care orders, assessments. There's nothing about a wound. Crap. Not good. So I tell him, hey, Henry, I think you're, you've got a wound brewing somewhere. I'd like to take a peek. He says, do what you got to do. Now, he was a guy in his mid-50s, early to mid-50s, young, and he was very gruff, right? He was like ex-military, very matter-of-fact, gruff. And uh, I turn him over and I look at all the usual suspects, all the ones we talked about earlier, right? The back of the head, the shoulders, the lower back, the uh, hip area, the back of the legs. I get down to his legs. And he's got those slipper socks on. You know the ones I'm talking about that have the white dots on the bottom, right? And I say, um, Henry, I got to take your socks off and look at your feet. And he immediately barked, no, leave my feet alone. Well, I found my problem. Because if he's telling me no, what did he tell the CNAs? Okay, so we have no idea how long this guy had gone with no one looking at his feet. And none of the CNAs reported that to the nurse. We have no idea. So I sweet talked him because you can always get further with patients by being nice than being mean. And I sweet talked him and I got a basin of salt water. We call it saline and warmed it up, brought it in, put his whole foot in there, um, sock and all. His uh, left sock I was able to get off, but his right sock was stuck to the bottom of his foot. So I soaked it for a while. I go back in, took the sock off, and I had to use a little bit of force to get that, that sock to separate from whatever was on the bottom of his foot. And something, as I kind of 
you know, use a little force to get it off, something went flying past my head. Now, not good. I'm counting toes. They're all there. What went flying past my head? And I look up on the floor and it's like this speckled floor, same baseboards, the whole nine yards, clinical setting. And as I looked, this is what I found on the floor. This is a white metal thumbtack. This isn't the thumbtack, but it's one just like it, <laughs> stuck in the bottom of his foot. Now, no one had seen it because, first of all, he wouldn't let anybody near his feet. But second of all, it was white and round and blended into the dots on the bottom of the sock. We have no idea how long this had been in his foot. No idea at all. Now, the problem is that he has diabetic retinopathy, which means he is diabetic. Diabetic means that he isn't going to have good blood flow to his feet. It also means that the nerves of his feet are coded and not able to transmit signals. So he had no idea this thing was in the bottom of his foot. So I'm now looking at the bottom of his foot and he's got an area about this big around hard black dead tissue. Now we're good in medicine. We can heal a lot of things, but dead is dead. We can't bring dead back from the life. So I know, or back, back to life. I know this guy has got a really bad road in front of him. And it's, I was sad. I mean, he was young. He was in his early to mid fifties, young. So I call the doctor, call the family, get the wound care consult, write up my notes, take my pictures. I leave, not my patient, not my facility. But this guy had stayed on my mind for a while, about, I don't know, less than a year, probably nine, 10 months later, I get assigned back to that facility. This time I'm on long-term care side and his name is on my list. So this guy did not get to go home. Remember before he was on rehab side, this guy did not get to go home and he's only in his fifties. This is horrible. So I go in, hey, Henry, I'm Patty. I'm the nurse that found the wound on your foot. I just, I'm here today, but I wanted to see how you were doing. I, you've been on my mind lately. He pulled the sheet aside and he had had to have a below the knee amputation. He lost his leg over this. Guys, foot care is important. It's important. It's even more important if the patient refuses that you tell the nurse. Because if this had been caught early, it wouldn't be a problem. We could have healed it. But because it was ignored, it turned into be a really big problem. But the worst part about this for me is that it was 100% preventable because if somebody had put shoes on him while he was walking, where would the thumbtack be? In the shoe. In the shoe. It would not be in his foot. And we don't amputate shoes, guys. If we're walking a patient, there's lots of sharp objects that could be on the floor. Thumbtacks are just one. In healthcare, we have needles. We have ampules. We have vials. We have trocars. We have scalpel. We have all kinds of things that are sharp that could potentially end up on that floor that somebody could step on. And if we have somebody who can't feel their feet, then we definitely don't want them walking around without some sort of protection on their feet. This could have been completely prevented. So we have to remember that slipper socks are not enough when the patient is out of bed. If your patient is out of bed, what should they have on their feet? Shoes. There's no exception to that. If the patient doesn't have shoes, go let the nurse know, hey, this patient has no shoes. We can call the family. We can call the facility. We can call the social worker. We can get that patient some shoes. But we need to protect them. My rule of thumb is if I would not let my grandchild walk on this floor barefoot, I am not going to let a patient walk on this floor barefoot. Slipper socks are not enough. Like that. He wasn't having a shower. No. No. And then he should have been aware of that. 
Absolutely. 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 And this guy paid for that with his leg. But not just his leg, his loss of independence, because now he's having to live in a nursing home in his 50s. Do you think that's what he had in mind when he thought about retirement? Somebody telling him he had to go to bed at 730? So we have to think about this from the patient's point of view. Slipper socks are never enough. When a patient's feet hit the floor, we have to talk about shoes. Make sense? Yes. Oh, keep someone in long-term care just for amputation? This particular patient had no one at home to help care for him, and he had some complications after surgery. Yep. Usually, no. Usually, um, you know, if there's no complications, patients can be discharged home, at least to have some family to help care for them, but this one didn't, this person didn't have anybody. So if they refuse to wear shoes, do you not want them to go tell the nurse? Just, yeah, let the nurse know and let them make the decision. It's not a decision that a CNA should make. So just leave them in the medical center. Right, right. I would let the nurse know and just, basically you're always safe having the nurse direct you because it's ultimately their license. So let's say that you just make the decision, okay, I don't have shoes, but I'm going to walk this person anyway. And something happens, that nurse is legally liable for that decision you just made. Yeah. So in that case, the nurse would be liable for what happened because the CNA is not report that that happened, but the nurse should have like visiting the patient. Absolutely. To detect the smell. Absolutely. Yeah, the nurses were ultimately liable for that because the nurses are responsible for making sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do. So the nurse not doing an assessment, the nurse not um, looking at the foot. Like I said, we have no idea how long it, it had been. There's a lot of failures. It, it wasn't a single point of failure. There were a lot of failures in this. Okay. But I use it as an illustration to show you just how important your job is. Good? Make sense? All right. So if they don't have shoes or refuse to wear them, make sure you let the nurse know and let them direct you from there. It's up to them what they want to do. Now, I'm going to tell you another problem with slipper socks. Are floors clean? Patients in clinical settings often have difficulty getting to the bathroom on time, which means that urine and feces is, are often leaked on their way to the floor now, or to the bathroom. Now, housekeeping does a good job, but there's still some residual that remains. If I get out of bed in slipper socks and walk to the bathroom and walk back to the bed, I get back into bed with those slipper socks on. Now, what just cuddled up next to me in bed? Absolutely. Absolutely. So slipper socks are not enough to go walking around the facility in. That is an infection control nightmare. And if that patient has any, any wounds or incisions, do you know where those pathogens are all going to try to migrate? Yeah, because they're warm, dark, and moist. And this is how we get surgical site infections. Okay. Slipper socks are not enough. Good? Questions? So this skill is pretty easy. We're going to soak the foot. We're going to take it out, put it on a towel, and wash it. We're going to put it back in the basin to rinse, take it out, and dry it. We're going to look at the foot while we do that. For the test, you need to say something about, I'm looking at the foot. We have to verbalize it. Your skin looks good. I don't see any abnormalities. I'm inspecting the foot. I'm looking at the foot. I don't care what you say, but they have to know that you know why you're there. You're not really there to wash the foot. You're there to have an excuse to look at the foot. Yep, look between the toes. 
So we are going to put lotion on the foot afterwards, but no lotion between the toes because lo lotion holds in moisture. And we have warm, dark, moist between the toes. If you hold in that moisture, you can end up with athlete's foot. So no lotion between the toes, but lotion everything else. Can we also wipe it off? Absolutely. Anytime we put lotion on, we want to warm it up first and wipe it off after. Yes. So there, if there's no cuts and wounds, obviously you don't have to wear gloves, but is that something you Okay, to so our glove rule is if we're going to touch any body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin. Now, so... Here, it's not personal skin, but here's the problem. We don't know if there's any non-intact skin. We don't know. That's the whole reason we're there is to look. So because we don't know, we should wear gloves. Okay. On top of that, it's just feet. Nobody wants to touch feet, right? And that's okay. That's, that's okay. But it's because of the unknown, because that's the whole reason we're doing this. Good? Questions? Let me show you this skill. So um, I have a question. So in um, in the case of the exam, we are doing the both feet or just one? The care, or excuse me, the care plan, plan no. um, for at the top of whatever page this is, uh, 119, 119 so tells us to do one foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're only gonna do one foot mm -hmm. for the test. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Wonderful. I need to do foot care. Is that okay? Yes. Let me go close your curtain, wash my hands, and then I'll gather your supplies. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get a barrier and we'll place this on the floor right in front of you and you can place your foot on the barrier. I'm going to get a basin, soap, and lotion. We'll place that on the barrier. I'm going to get two washcloths and a towel and a set of gloves. I'm going to get some water for washing. Mr. Jones, would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? Yes. Is it great. good? Yes, great. Very good. I'm going to set this here. And I'm going to kneel on the barrier and apply my gloves. I'm going to roll up your pants leg and lift your foot so I can remove your sock. We'll place your foot in the basin to soak. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out, making sure that your foot is wet. I'm going to place your foot over here on the towel and apply soap to the washcloth. I'm going to wash all surfaces of the foot. I'm going to lift your foot up so I can wash the bottom and I'll observe for any red areas, woes, sores, or any other abnormalities. We'll put your foot back in the basin to rinse.
Okay, I'm going to place your foot on the towel to dry. And I'll ensure all surfaces have been dried thoroughly. I'll take one of the narrow edges and go between your toes to blot. And I'll dry the bottom of your foot. Now I'm going to apply some lotion. We'll warm the lotion in our hands. And apply lotion to all surfaces except between the toes. So I'm going to lift your foot and we'll apply lotion to the bottom as well as the top. And now I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion so that you don't slip. Okay, go ahead and place your foot back on the barrier. And now I can reapply your sock. And we'll put your shoe back on. Can you slide your foot in there for me, please? Okay, Mr. Jones, I need to put all of my supplies away now. I'm going to gather my dirty linen and place it in the dirty linen hamper. I'm going to take the basin to the sink and clean according to the basin cleaning procedure. On the way back, I'll collect the soap and the lotion and put the basin back in the drawer. Now I'll collect the barrier and throw it away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is here. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. Can I get you a magazine while you're waiting? No, thank you. I'm going to open my curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. So the great question is this comes up quite a bit. So let me get my mic on so everybody can hear me. Um, the answer, or the question is, do you have to say everything I say during this skill? And the answer is no, you're not being graded on using those exact words, but you are being graded on keeping the patient um, in the loop. Okay. So think about if you were the patient and you're in a strange place surrounded by strange people and they're putting their hands on you, what would you want to know? Why, but also each step of the way, yeah. Um, because otherwise they don't know what's coming next, what to expect, they're gonna stiffen up, they're gonna pull away, they're gonna be a little resistant just because of the unknown. And remember, most people in healthcare hurt the patient. What we're doing doesn't hurt, but do they know that? No, so telling them every step of the way what we're doing can help engender trust, um, and ensure cooperation, which just ultimately makes our job easier. Uh, when we do uh, bed bath, are we also cleaning foot and hands, or are those we're going to take care of when is it foot and hand? Um, we're going to follow the care plan. Okay. Yeah, simple answer is we're going to follow the care plan. Depends on what you have available for the test. All you have is a sink or a toilet. Those are your only two options. So sink is fine. Sink is fine. Yeah. The next one is after she done the she used the same glove and close the the um, tap. Right. Remember the faucet is not clean. It's never considered clean. 
Okay. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right, let's um, let's move on to mouth care. I'm going to get through this um, pretty quickly. This is just brushing teeth, guys. Not a whole lot here to learn. We already know all of the principles involved. We know to follow the care plan, do our opening. We'll evaluate if we need gloves. We do, body fluids. We're going to use a barrier. Linen rules apply. We'll clean the basin the same way we clean everything else. And we're going to do our closing. So nothing really new to learn here. Pretty easy, actually. No new principles. Let's look at the care plan at the top, page 93. It says a resident with natural teeth is lying in bed and needs mouth care. The resident is not able to provide their own mouth care. Remember, if a patient can brush their own teeth, they will. We may have to set up. We may have to clean up. But if they can brush their own teeth, they will. If they can't, we will. It's pretty much that simple. Um, so there's not really much we have to concentrate on learning here. We already know the first thing our gloves should touch is the patient. patient. Uh, we know not to let the supplies touch our uniform. We know to use a barrier on the table if we're going to use supplies. And is laying down a safe position for our patient to be in for mouth care? No, so we have to put the head of the bed up. When you do that, they're not grading on. They don't care when you put the head of the bed up. Me, personally, I care. Because that bed controller is not clean. So I would prefer that you not touch that bed controller with your clean hands and then touch the supplies with those hands. So I would prefer that you do your opening, you um, wash your hands like normal, and then get a paper towel to use between your hands and the bed controller when you put the head of the bed up. Now, the video I'm going to show you does it a little bit differently. I've changed the process. This is an older video. We are getting ready to retape everything. Um, this is an older video. You're going to see me put the head of the bed up during the opening, and that's okay. You can do that. But it's actually better to do it after you've washed your hands with a paper towel. Okay, so that's going to be the main difference in what you're going to see. All right, so safety first. We want to make sure the patient is sitting straight up in bed. Uh, remember that um, laying down is not a safe position. If you don't raise the head of the bed, the patient may aspirate, which is the clinical term for breathing liquid into the lungs. Um, you can use a paper towel to keep your hands clean. So your step-by-step -step instructions in the book have it the correct way. The video I'm going to show you, I put the head of the bed up before I wash my hands, do this instead. Okay, so I'm going to tell you that's a change. Um, we want to protect their clothing from toothpaste, so a towel over their chest is appropriate. Do all of your prep work, wet your toothbrush, put toothpaste on it before you put your gloves on, and then just brush. Nobody's timing it. You don't have to brush for two minutes, but you do have to get the top, the bottom, the front, the back, and the tongue. Nobody cares how long that takes. The patient has to rinse. Now, when you're in your home standing over your sink, um, you can use as much toothpaste as you want. But when you're brushing somebody else's teeth and they're in bed, you just want to use a little bit of toothpaste. Otherwise, you're going to be standing there rinsing for the next three years because all that toothpaste doesn't have anywhere to go. And it can actually end up going down the back of their throat. So a little bit of toothpaste is all you need for this skill. Okay. At the end of the scale, dry your patient off. Nobody wants to be a wet, soapy mess. Dry them off. And um, make sure that, that you leave the environment clean. So I'm going to show you this video. This is a very quick skill. Everybody knows how to brush teeth. This is just on somebody else. So not a whole lot to learn here. Okay.
Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to do mouth care. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put the head of your bed up. And then I'll close the curtain, wash my hands, and gather my supplies. Okay. We'll get you to a full upright sitting position for safety. And if I can get you to lean forward, please. There you go. Is that more comfortable? Yes, much. Okay. I'm going to close your curtain and wash my hands now. I'll gather my supplies. I'm going to start with a barrier and we'll place that on your overbed table. I'm going to get a towel, a set of gloves, a basin, toothbrush and toothpaste, and a cup of water. We'll prepare the toothbrush first. Always wet your toothbrush first. We'll get it wet, place a little bit of toothpaste on it, and set it in the basin. Mr. Jones, can I place this towel over your chest? Yes, please. Okay. And now I'll apply my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you open wide for me? I'm going to brush the back on the bottom. The back on the top. And can you bring your teeth together? And stick your tongue out for me. Thank you. Set that aside. Go ahead and take a sip. Rinse your mouth. Let me wipe that off for you. Another sip. No, thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to dispose of my cup, wrapper, and toothbrush. I'll be right back. I'm going to remove the towel and place it into dirty linen. I'm going to go and clean the basin and I'll be right back. Dump it, rinse it, set it down, take it up with paper towel, dry the inside, dry the outside. If the floor fence thinks the tape is going to be there for a few days, do you keep the same secret? Yes. Use it? Yes. I'll place the toothpaste in the basin, use the paper towel to open the drawer, and place the basin and toothpaste in the drawer. I'll clean up my work environment and go throw these items away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? A magazine? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is right here. If you should have any needs, let me know. Can I adjust the head of the bed for you? No, this is great. Okay. I'm going to open the curtain and go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about my skill, make any corrections I need to make, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that? Any questions? No? All right, so this is a common question that shows up. Do I have to brush everybody's teeth? And the answer is no. We're only going to brush the teeth of the patients that cannot brush their own. This is a very intimate skill, guys. Nobody wants anybody in their mouth that they don't have to be. 
it would be very awkward for me to come to your house tomorrow morning and insist on brushing your teeth when you're perfectly capable of doing it yourself. It's just as weird for the patients. So if they can brush their own teeth, we're going to make that happen however we need to make it happen. Make sense? Okay. All right. So um, last skill today is on page 54. And this is respirations. This is a very short skill. If you look at the bottom of the page here, you'll see somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this skill within five minutes or less. So it's a very short skill. If you read the care plan at the top of page 55, whoops, I don't have that one up here. If you read the care plan at the top of page 55, it tells us count patients' respirations for one full minute, record our readings. So we're only counting for one minute. They're giving us five minutes to do that. We have our opening, we have our closing, but there's, you know, they're giving you way more time than you actually need here. But there's a couple of things about respirations that make it a little different than other skills that we do. And that's what I want to kind of focus on here. Um, there's no new principles to learn, but there are a few skill specific things. Oh, there it is. There's the care plan. When we're counting respirations, we don't want to let the patient know that we're counting the respirations. If I tell you, okay, I'm going to count your breathing. Ready? Go. Yeah, you'll stop breathing. Yeah, absolutely. You end up stopping breathing or you start breathing faster because now you're anxious. So we don't want to tell somebody I'm counting your breathing because now they're aware of it. So to do this skill, even though we have to get consent, we don't want to tell them what we're doing. So how do we do that? Well, for this skill, we're going to say, I'm going to take your vital signs. Respirations is a part of vital signs but they don't need to know which one we're actively taking. Does that make sense? Okay. Now there's another problem with this. In and out is counted as one cycle. So if you breathe in and then out, all of that together counts as one. So it doesn't matter whether you start on the in or if you start on the out. <laughs> if it happened, you count it. Okay, in and out counts as one whole cycle. So to demonstrate, okay, it doesn't matter whether you count on the in, in the middle, or the out, it counts as one. Good? But breathing isn't that exaggerated. Breathing is easy, quiet, even. You shouldn't even be able to hear the breathing audibly. You know, breathing is just like chill. If you can hear it, that's abnormal. What would you do with that information? Tell the nurse. Tell the nurse. Like if it's rattly, if it's labored, if they're wheezing, sure, all of those things require that you tell the nurse. E breathing should be easy, quiet, even. Okay. But there's another problem with this, and I need somebody to come lay in this bed so I can show you. Come on over. It is comfortable, yes. If you can put your arms at your sides for me. Sorry, YouTube world. I forgot my microphone here. Okay. So here's the main problem with respirations, okay? I'm not going to tell the patient that I'm counting her breathing, although she knows I am. But here's the problem with respirations. Let's see how comfortable she is with this. Ready? Start. Pretty weird, isn't it? I am just standing here staring at your chest. It's really high on the creep meter. Okay. You do not want to just stand over somebody and stare at them quietly, not saying anything. It's 
weird. You can't do that. Your patient is going to get very anxious with that. So when you're taking respirations, you want them to actually think you're taking the pulse. So I would do my whole opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm here to get your vital signs. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands, right? I've done my whole opening. When I come back to the patient, I actually want to hold her wrist like I'm taking her. I'm not actually finding her pulse. I'm holding her hand, basically. But she doesn't know that. If her focus is now going to be here, so now, does that make you more comfortable? It does, doesn't it? So I know it's kind of a psychological thing. It's, it's, it's strange, but if I don't point that out to you, if you just came over here and stood over the patient, that's just creepy. Don't do that. But there's something that you can do to make this a little bit easier on you for the test. And you can use it in a clinical setting too, but since we're focusing on the test, there's something you can do to make this easier. Now, when you're counting respirations, you're going to look at the tummy and watch it go up and down. So those of you over there, you probably, if you pay really, really close attention, if you look really, really hard, you might be able to see the tummy go up and down. And that's how we would count the respirations. But it's hard to see. We want those evaluators to stay on the other side of the room. We don't want them right up close to us because that just makes us nervous. We want them as far away as possible. So it's kind of hard to see the tummy moving up and down from far away. If you put an alcohol pad, if you put an alcohol pad on the tummy, now, what did that do to your ability to see it? Way easier, right? This doesn't affect her breathing at all. What I did is use psychology. I affected your brain's ability to see it. This is because our eye is drawn to movement when it's a contrasting color. Um, it, it's what kept us safe in the saber-toothed tiger days, right? You'd see that flash of orange going by and it would alert you, hey, there's something going on. So your eye is drawn to movement when it's a contrasting color. And if you put an alcohol pad on their stomach, it makes it easier for everybody to see it, including the evaluators. So okay. You should do it for the test. Yeah, absolutely. Good. So I'm going to do this whole skill from beginning to end. I will simulate hand washing so you can see how to simulate. Okay. And we together will count her respirations. After I do my opening, I'll put an alcohol pad on her tummy. I'm going to look at the clock, say start out loud, and then you guys count her respirations until I say stop. At the end of the skill, I'll document and then I'll tell you what I got and you can see how close you, you are. For the test, you can be off by two breaths in either direction and still be considered accurate. Okay, everybody good? All right, here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, how are you? I am fantastic. I need to get your vital signs. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. I've washed my hands. That's all simulation is. I'm washing my hands now. I've washed my hands, however you want to say it. Okay. I'm just going to lay this here for a second. And I will need you to remain quiet. This is going to take me about a minute but I'll let you know as soon as I'm done, okay? okay? All right, can everybody see? Everybody good? Ready, set, start.
stop. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Okay, call light is somewhere under you. We're going to pretend that you can reach it. I'm going to open the curtain. I'm washing my hands. I'll review the care plan, make any corrections I need to make, and then tell the evaluator my skill. Wash my hands and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Thank you very much. What did you guys get? Nine. Nine? Okay. That's what I got. Um, normal is between 12 and 20. So if we got nine, what would we do with that information? Report it to the nurse. Now, she's just very chill. Um, there's nothing wrong with her breathing. She's perfectly okay. But is that a, a decision you guys can make? No. Okay. Is everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. Pretty easy, right? This skill, if you go to page, hold on. Man, I'm so stuffy. You go to page 25 in your book. I want you to kind of look through all of those care plan sets and see how many of them have respirations. You guys getting four? So out of the 11 care plan sets, four of them have this skill. You have a pretty decent chance of getting this skill on the state exam. Good. It is the um, documentation skill that is assigned the most. All right. So how long do you count for? What do you guys think? There it is. Yeah. Whatever the care plan tells us to for this skill, our care plan says one full minute. Absolutely. And if the care plan doesn't specify, we can do the same thing we did for pulse. We can count for that 15 seconds and multiply that by four. Okay. Normal values are between 12 and 20. If you get under 12, you need to tell the nurse. If you get over 20, you need to tell the nurse. If we get under 12 on the test, what do we do? Tell the nurse. <laughs> do we just say I would tell the nurse? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah, this is below normal values, I would tell the nurse. Now, I will tell you that there is no checkpoint for the test that, te that says recognized abnormal values. So it, they're not grading you on it, but I would certainly point it out. I would certainly point it out. I have a whole lesson on documentation principles on page 48. But there's a couple things that I want to point out. First of all, as CNAs, we very rarely document in words. Most places are going to require check marks, like you check off skills when you do them. And some will allow you to document using numbers like pulse, respiration, feeding percentages, um, intake and output. But very few places are going to let you write words. And that's because documentation is legal. It's a legal document. And every word you write, that facility is legally liable for. 
So if you get to document in words, you're going to have to go through additional training about uh, documentation legalities, what's allowed, what's not allowed. But there's a couple things that I do want you to be aware of. One of those is that you need to be accurate. If you did it, you document it. If you didn't do it, you can't document it. Documentation has to be done by the person actually doing the skill. I also want you to be brief. Don't go on to long, drawn-out stories. Be brief, but be complete. So we call this the ABCs of documentation, accurate, brief, and complete. I want you to re, uh, reduce the use of I statements. I walked in the room and saw. That should not show up in documentation. You should never be the focus of medical documentation. It should always be about the patient. So instead of I walked in the room and saw the patient on the floor, it would be after entering the room, the patient was noted to be on the floor. You notice how the um, focus is then on the patient, not on you. So we want to limit the use of I statements. You also want to be brief. So by brief, it's not, I wouldn't say, um, I went to lunch and then after lunch, Susie wasn't available to check on the patient. So I went in and checked on the patient and the patient was on the floor. That's too much external information that we don't need. Okay, brief. Make sense? Most of the time we're going to be documenting in black ink. Um, but go by your facility policy always. That's going to be something they cover in orientation, what color ink you can use. And believe it or not, that is a really big deal, the color of ink you use. Yeah. It is a really big deal. Um, so if you're a colorful person that has like purple markers in your backpack, you cannot use them. Uh, some places will uh, use different colors for different shifts, like day shift is black, uh, afternoon shift is green, and night shift is red. They used to do that years and years ago, but they, um, for the most part, I think most places have stopped doing that. Most documentation now is electronic. You're going to type it into an electronic system. Some places are still a little slow adopting that, so go by your facility policy. Always check during orientation what your documentation requirements are. When uh, taking care of your patients and passing, a coworker says, Hey, I did check Mrs. Jones so and so. Can you check it off because I forgot to? Are you allowed to do that legally? Nope. 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 So let me explain why. Okay. And it sounds like, you know, this nothing big, nothing major. You know, you're doing it for a coworker, a friend. But here's the problem by checking that off, you are stating that you physically have knowledge that it was done, that you're the one that physically did it. So what if? Let's go back to Henry for a second. What if I'm going off shift and I say, yeah, um, and I'm a CNA, right? Yeah. So check off that the foot care was done on everybody. Just check it off for me. I didn't get a chance to. Was foot care ever done on Henry? No. 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 So we're falsifying a legal document. We're saying that we did something that we did not do. And that's a legal document. Okay. If you make a mistake, we don't use white out. We don't ever destroy legal documents, ever. You simply draw one line through it, write error above it with your initials. And I have done that. Oh, man, have I done that. I wrote out this whole page of information and realized I'm in the wrong chart. You can't destroy it. You have to write a line through it. It still has to be readable. You can't white it out. You can't put a marker through it. It has to be readable. So one line through it, error, and your initials. Claim ownership. Okay. So good? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because it's a legal document, and you're not allowed to destroy ever any legal documents, but you also aren't allowed to obscure it. 
because lawyers are suspicious creatures. Have you ever met a lawyer? They are suspicious creatures. And if you white something out or put a Sharpie through it so nobody can see it, you're clearly hiding something. What are you hiding? And when they get you into deposition, they're going to tear you to pieces. So even though it was the other patient's chart, yep. you would keep it just to avoid having Absolutely. suspicions. Absolutely. Yep. Even electronic medical records, guys, you can't delete something. No, but like if you made a mistake, like you can hit the backspace on those, right? Every keystroke is logged. Every keystroke is logged. So yes, you can hit the backspace, but there is still an electronic record of that that can't that is going to be discovered if it goes to, to court. Yeah. Talking on the computer, how do you put you don't. You can backspace, but every keystroke is logged, so they're going to see that. As um, most EMRs, electronic medical records, will have a, a thing that pops up and says, um, "Did you mean to delete that? Did you mean to backspace? It was this an error?" I need to say yes. Yeah. Okay. But again, you have to go through the training wherever your documentation training wherever you work. Okay. Yeah. The line we want to cross. The whole sentence. Every sentence is going to have a line, 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 error. If it's just one word, just put a line through the word that's messed up. Yeah. The biggest thing is don't try to obscure it or get rid of it. That's the biggest piece of information I have to give you on that. You may have a question on the state exam what to do when you make a, an error documenting. And that is the correct answer. Draw a line through it, write error, and your initials above it. Don't ever, don't ever choose white out. White out is never the right answer. <laughs> yeah, or destroy it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So anybody have any questions about what we've gone through so far? We're going to completely switch gears. Okay, so for those of you playing along at home, I'm going to give you information on where to find everything that we're going to do together in class. Take one packet and pass the rest on. Take one packet and pass the rest on. So if you go to my website, foryourcna.com, under testing, look at test registration instructions. Everything we're going to go over is here along with... Um, links to all of these um, resources that we're about to go through. So this page, which is the first page that you see here on the front, this is our timeline. This is how the test registration works. Okay, so I made these packets up for you. This is the actual registration packet. We're going to go through it step by step. But this tells us how we're going to do this. The first thing that you need to do is make a background check appointment. If you don't already have a level two photo enabled background check for medical. So those of you who are foster parents, that level two background check does not work for this. If you work for the school system, that level two background check does not work for this. If you have your concealed carry permit, that level two background check does not work for this. It has to be for medical. Should work. I don't know for sure, but we're, I'm going to tell you what to do. If you don't have a level two background check, get one. If you already have one, go to step two, but there's, when you get the response back, there's a, a place you're going to look to make sure. So background check, and we're going to start here with the process. Once we do the background check, uh, one or two days or so, you can uh, apply for the test, okay? 
Really, it's 24 hours, but I like to give it just a couple of days to get through, especially this time of year. Now, let me explain something to you. This is the worst time of year to try to become a CNA. From mid-April through June is the highest volume of CNA testing for the entire year. Every high school program is graduating. They all have to test before graduation. Every community college is graduating. They all have to test before graduation. Every vocational school is graduating. They all have to test before graduation. So from mid-April until June, please be aware that there will be testing delays due to volume. Everybody got that? So I would suggest that you do your background check, wait about two days before you register for the test. That way they can make sure that everything gets routed to the right place. Do the background check after the eighth class? You can do it today. You can do it right away. All right. Once we do the background check, we're going to register for the test. There's two ways to register. Paper application, which you have in your hand. We're going to fill out together or online, which is the exact same thing, just online. <laughs> online goes faster, but you have to have a little bit of computer skill because you're going to have to create an account, check your email, verify the account, create a password that's one of those super secret passwords with so many characters, letters, and numbers, and symbols, and all that. If you have trouble doing those types of things, just mail in the application that I gave you. Okay. Mailing it in does lengthen the process though. Add about two weeks of processing time if you're mailing in versus registering online. After you register for the test, about one to three days later, you're going to get an email back from Prometric. This is step three. When you get that email back from Prometric, you need to open the attachment. And there's going to be two areas that I want you to pay attention to. For you specifically, you want to pay attention to the one that says FBI background status. If that says record found, you're fine. They looked, they found your background check. Yay. If it says record not found, that means you got to go get a background check. The other thing that you're going to want to look at is just above this, it's going to say application status complete. You want it to say complete. That means that they got your, your registration, your background, and your payment. Yay. Already. If any one of those three is missing, if your application is not complete, if they didn't get payment for whatever reason, or if they can't find your background check, it's going to say incomplete. Once you get this and it says complete, record found, um, all you got to do is wait. Everything now is out of your hands. There's nothing more for you to do. It takes about seven to 10 days to get a um, response from Prometric with your registration date. But I want to explain what's happening in this time period. Now, for you guys, it's going to be up to 30 days just because of volume, okay? Normally, it's about 7 to 10, but let me explain what's happening here. When you submit your registration to Prometric and your payment, they have to wait for your payment to clear. And then they have to go look for your background check. And they put all of that together in a packet and they send it to the Board of Nursing. This is not an automated process. This is an actual hands-on process. Somebody at the Board of Nursing, a real person, has to look at your background check and your application, make sure they match completely, and make sure that you don't have any disqualifying offenses. This is not an automated system. This is an eyes on system. So when you think about all the volume of people that they're going to have to do this for, right, to clear you for testing, you can see that it can take up to 30 days to get this done. Once the Board of Nursing clears you for testing, you'll get an email from Prometric with your test date on it. It'll also give you your test location. Can you your test location? We're, we're going to get there. Hold on. I'm going to take you through the whole thing, I promise. Okay. Okay. 
So they're going to give you your test location and your test date. All testing is done on the same day. So your written and your skills is going to be done on the same day. When you get your test admission letter, it's going to tell you you're authorized for the um, written test at 9 and the skills test at 9.05. That does not mean you've only got five minutes. It just means you're scheduled for both portions on the same day. You can expect it to last all day. You have to be there no later than 8.30. If you arrive after 8.30, you are considered late and they have the option not to test you. So your test starts at 9. You have to be there at 8.30, no later than. Okay. Good. You will be there until you are done testing. Bring a lunch. Bring a lunch or lunch money, either way. Okay, so everybody understand the process? Let's go through it step by step. So the... Um, this is Prometric's website, prometric.com slash nurseage slash FL. It's on the page I gave you, that first page. You don't have to take notes on this. I've got this whole process um, already done for you, okay? So you go to uh, prometric.com. This is more for those people that are watching. You go to prometric.com slash nurseage slash FL. Get out of my way here. And under candidate resources, you're going to open up that um, accordion. And down here, we have FLDOH fingerprint vendor list. For you guys in my class, I have right here, right here, I have Deontis, which is who you should use. That's our local fingerprint vendor, Deontis. They use the UPS store on Spring Hill Drive in Barclay. They also have one in Citrus for those in Lacanto for those of you in Citrus County. Um, but for everybody else, if you need to find a fingerprint vendor, this is where you go to find the current vendor list. Now for Deontis, for my people, and they have um, offices all over Florida, so you can use them too. But Deontis, when you go onto their website, it's a little confusing. This is what their website looks like. And you're like, well, what do I click on? So you can click on here to register or up here, create an account. Either one of these will send you to here and you want to create an account. That's step one. But this is a little confusing. You guys are going to want to replay this. Okay. This is a little bit confusing because once you create an account, it gives you this. And which one do you choose? Do you choose Florida services or double check? We don't know, right? When we look at this, it doesn't give us any information. You want to choose Florida services. That's going to be where CNA training or testing is going to be located. Florida services. You're going to need this ORI number. It's right there in the shaded part. When you um, register for your background check, you need this ORI number, EDOH0380Z. And you're going to put it here in Deontis's. Um, website. This is a code that tells them why you need the background check. Where are we supposed to send it? Because when they do the background check, they're not going to give it to you. It has to be submitted electronically. Because if you get your own background check, uh, you got Photoshop. <laughs> I can erase anything, right? So they can't let you have any um, involvement in the background check process. So they got to know, where do we send it? Who is requesting this? Who needs it? If you do have a background, all you have to do is apply for the test. They're going to try to find it. But this is where I said it's a little bit dicey yeah. because when you, when you got your background check, it was probably through an employer, probably through ACA, right? That goes to a different filing cabinet. This is going to Prometrics filing cabinet, right? Direct to their inbox. Yours at ACA, totally different filing cabinet on the other side of the room. And they've got to look in the right drawer. And that's why I'm saying that it may not show up. So when you get that response back from Prometric, you need to make sure it says record found. 
That means they went to the filing cabinet, they opened the right drawer, they found you. Yay. If it says record not found, you've got to go through this process to get it sent directly to them. Yes, we're going to get there. Hold on. Always, always costs. Not quite that much. We're going to get there. I've got a slide on it. Trust me, I got a slide on everything. I guys, you guys are going through 1287 slides in this class. That's how many slides I created for this class. 1287 slides. So when I say I'm thorough, I'm thorough. <laughs> I don't know. And, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to mislead you by saying possibly, I don't know. So again, apply for the test. If it says record not found, you're going to have to go through this process. It take longer to do it that yes, though? it does. So if you're not sure, it's probably best to just get the background check. Right. Anyways. Now background checks are good for five years. Yes. And the good thing is this is going into something called the clearinghouse, which your future employers have access to. Because you're going to need a background check to go to work. Mm -hmm. By putting this in the right place, your um, employers can access it. And that way you won't have to get one for your employer. Sometimes the employer paid for it, which helps, but you don't have right. to wait for that. So. Right. All right. So once you put that code in, it's going to bring this up and asking you to verify, are you taking... Um, or are, is this the right code, Department of Health photo required? And the answer is yes. So we're going to hit next. Request information. The reason we want to open that up and it says other employment and licensing, because licensing is what we're going for here. And once you choose that, it's going to ask for an OCA number. We leave that blank. This is why I have to have this up here, because this is very confusing. It's asking for a lot of stuff that some of it we have, some of it we don't. That's why I gave you that first page. It gives you the information you need. Okay. You're going to complete the personal information. Review that. Here is where you're going to choose your uh, location for the background check. You can see they have locations all over our area. So um, put it Put in your zip code and it'll bring the one up closest to you. This is where you're going to set your schedule, right? So what day, when you click your day, and usually they have like same day appointments, guys. You can choose your day. Yeah, you can choose your day and you can choose your time. And our total is $76.68. You're going to pay when you set your appointment, okay? Now that has to be done online, right? This has to be done online. Yeah. Yep. Now you can do a walk-in at the UPS store. You can walk in and say, hey, I need the CNA exam background check, but they're going to charge you like an extra 15 bucks for them to put your information in. Okay. So that's the way I get mine. Yep. And they do. They charge you. If they're going to type the information in, they're going to get paid for it. Okay. But if that process is, if they don't find me, so they'll be able to find me before I do the payment and everything, if I'm in August? This, this has nothing, so this is, has nothing to do with you. Okay. You're going to register for the test, not for this. This is for the background check. You're going to register for the test. When you register for the test and you get the response back, if it says record not found, then you have to go through this. Okay. So once you make payment, now you go to the appointment at whatever date and time you set up. They're going to take a picture, fingerprints, and a signature, and that's it. You get to go home, and nobody's going to give you anything. They don't give you anything to send in anywhere, take anywhere, do anything with. You go to the appointment. You go home. One to three days later, you can apply for the test. Okay. But nobody's going to tell you, okay, we sent it. They've got it. There's no, nothing more happens after you go to the appointment. Is that appointment at the UPS? This is at the UPS, so yes. You have to go get your fingerprints and everything else taken. Right, right. So that's what you can choose the date for. Right. You can't choose the date for the test. For the test, right, right. Um, do you know if a uh, background check from immigration would work? It does not. Okay. Does not. 
Okay, so after you do your background check, you're ready to register for the exam. Like I said, I would wait one to three days from the time you do your background check until you go to register. We're going back to prometric.com slash nurse slash Florida. And when we do that, now we're on step two. We're ready to register for the test. Two ways of doing that, online or by mail. If you want to mail in this packet, that's the address you're going to mail it to. If you want it to be done quicker, you're going to do it online. Okay. So if we go to Prometric, there's their address again. Okay, um, Helen, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be able to answer that right now. I'm already over time and I got to get through this. So I'm not going to be able to talk about social worker right now. Um, so this is the address to mail in your application. This is an email address if you have any problems and their phone number is there as well. So now we want to get to the actual application. So under application process, you can see that we have two options, online or paper. Paper is what you guys have in front of you. I've already printed it out for you. And I've filled out part of it for you. Um, right now, we're going to talk about the paper application because that's what you have in front of you. The online is exactly the same thing. And on my website, I have, I do an actual online registration right on the screen. You can watch it and follow along. But this is the beginning of your online application, or I'm sorry, your, your paper application. This is page one. Okay, it's got a stop sign on it. It says stop, please make sure your name is your name. So it's like on page three of your, your packet there. Yep. All right, so here it asks you to make sure that you have two forms of ID that match the name that you're putting on the registration. And down here, it's going to ask if you need ADA accommodations, Americans with Disabilities Act, you know, like a sign language interpreter or a seeing eye dog or something like that. Down here, it's going to ask you for your candidate information. We're not going to go through that. You can do this part on your own. It's your information. That follows through on, um, keep going here. That follows through to page two here. This is all your demographic information. But let's go down to this section here. This section here where it says criminal and Medicaid, Medicare fraud questions, mandatory. You guys with me? Everybody with me? If you have a felony, see me after class. If you have no felonies in your background, for number one and two, check no. Leave these blank. Leave the A, B, C, D, E blank. One and two, check no. One and two, check no. You can go ahead and do it right on the form I just gave you. One and two, check no. If you have a felony in your background, see me after class. You're going to answer three, four, and five. And again, you're going to leave the A's, B's, C's, D's blank if you answer no. But let me let me tell you what this is. Because the way they've got this worded is super confusing. If you worked for or were a medical professional involved in Medicare fraud. Fraud. Now, I'm not talking about you qualified for Medicaid without being, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you worked for a doctor who billed Medicare for processes they did not perform and they got a boatload of money from it and you were told specifically you cannot work in medicine anymore. That's who these questions apply to. If you've never been told that you're not allowed to work in medicine, if you've never worked for a healthcare professional that defrauded Medicare and got caught and you were a part of that prosecution, then your answers are no to these three questions. Three, four, and five, your answers are no. Just the main question. Just the main question. Do not check off A, B, C, D, or E. And for three, four, and five, it's no. Three, four, and five is no.
disciplinary history, if you've ever been a medical professional before, these apply to you. If you were a speech therapist in Indiana and knocked around some old people and got your certification taken away, this applies to you. If you've never been a medical professional, the answer is no to all four questions. Um, you want to read an answer. It's asking if you've ever had any disciplinary action. Okay. Criminal history, pretty easy. Yes or no? You either have one or you don't. If the answer is maybe, it's probably yes. Second question there asks if anything has ever been sealed or expunged. Third question is juvie. We were all young and dumb. Not all of us got caught. Okay. On page four of the application, these are questions you have to answer and they take these very seriously. Healthcare is stressful, people. It is not an easy job. They want to make sure that you are emotionally equipped to handle the stress of healthcare. If you have current mental health concerns that require hospitalization or you have a substance abuse disorder, they want to know about it. That's what these questions are going to uh, address, and you have to answer them honestly. You also need to put your social security number here. You can do that on your own. Now, go to the next page. And again, this is important. I've actually done this part for you. At the top of page four, we have certification option eligibility. You have to check E3 Challenger. And if you've noticed, I've already done that for you. E3 Challenger. I'm not letting you put anything else there. E3 Challenger. On top of page four. E3 Challenger. It's five. I'm sorry, five. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I need new glasses. I can't read it. <laughs> I've checked off E3 Challenger. I've also put a great big giant X through training information. You don't need that because we only fill that out if we check E1 or E2. What did we check? E3. E3, it does not apply to us. But let's go to the next section where it says test site information. We're going to che check regional test site, which or test yeah, regional test site, which I've already checked off for you. But now you have to tell them where you want to test. So let's go back in our packet, back in the packet to these two pages. This is a listing of all of the test sites in Florida. I typed this up for you. This is recent. And if you look in Central, which is where we are, you can pick a spot close to you. For us here, right here, it's going to be um, hold on. the last one at the bottom of this page, Agilis. That is our closest one to us. It's just down the parkway near the airport. There is another Tampa one, but it's way over by Bush Gardens. Those of you in Citrus County might find it easier to test in Ocala. But there's several options. You can choose the one closest to you. Um, you can look at the addresses to map quest them out if you want to and decide where you want to test. Okay? So for the code, do you have to put the CNA hyphen or just do the other part of it? Just the other part of it. Okay. Yeah. You can put the CNA hyphen, that's fine, but yeah, just yeah, the other part is what part. they're looking for. Okay. All right, and then we get down to fees. Okay, then we get down to fees. Um, the fees, for most of you, you're going to check the first box here. It's just a plain Jane test. It's the one everybody takes. If you need the computer to read the test questions to you, if English is not your first language, if you have a reading disability, if you have a um, attention deficit problem and you need the computer to read the written test questions to you, check the second option. There's other options there if you want the written test in Spanish, but the skills have to be taken in English. All skills or all testing is 155. 
Doesn't matter whether you have the computer read it to you or if you take it in Spanish, it's all 155. Now there's some other options there too, but those don't count for us. Those are if we have to retake a portion of the test. So you're taking two portions, written and skills. The written test, if you fail it, you would only have to retake the written part. And that, if you look here, is $35. If you have to retake the skills portion, if you look here, the skills is $120. I want you to pass them both and not have to worry about that. But you only have to retake the portion that you missed. So most first-time testers are going to check that very first box. And then your total fee would be one fifty-five. Right. right. I'm just, we're just going over it. I'm already nervous. <laughs> you guys are going to be fine. You're going to be fine. I still have two weeks left of class. <laughs> yep. Now you can register now. If you register now, you will be testing about roughly two to three weeks after graduation, which is perfect timing. Enough time that you can practice and get the skills down, but not so long that you forget what you've learned. So I would register as, remember, there's, gonna, there's a huge volume. You want to try to beat that volume. So I would register now. Remember I said mid-April to June. If you register now, you're kind of beating that volume. My next class is, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, and then the very last, or the page six here, it's asking you to check a box, yes or no. What you're checking is that you have received these two pages that I've attached for you. This is their privacy policy. It tells you how they're going to use your information to clear you for testing and what to do if you suspect that there's a problem with that process. Okay, so you have those pages. You can check yes there. And then you're going to sign and date. The last page is your payment information. So you would fill this out to make payment. Now, once you get this packet done, you can just pop it in the mail and you're done. It's all filled out for you. Yeah, you take the first page and that last page off. Or, you know, the, the page, everything but the application itself. Take it off. Um, those are just for your information. But you can just mail that whole packet in if you want to. But remember, that makes the processing time longer because somebody else has to enter all of that into the system. They are saying that you should receive your authorization to test letter within 10 to 14 business days after you submit this. They should be able to clear you for testing 10 to 14 days after you submit this. Remember I said we're going into high volume. Give them up to 30. Okay. All right. So after you um, submit your application, one to three days later, you should get an email. That email should say application status complete. If it doesn't, there's a problem. And Prometrics website actually tells you this. If it's been five business days since you applied and you haven't heard anything from them, you need to call them because maybe you typed in your email wrong. Maybe they can't get in touch with you. Or maybe your email is blocking them, which happens if you have a Yahoo email address. Yahoo is horrible. Yahoo blocks all the things that should block and lets everything through that it shouldn't. So Yahoo is problematic. So contact them using this information if you don't hear back from them. All right, so homework over the weekend. Read chapters five and six. They are long. Schedule your time accordingly. Chapter five is on dementia. Pay attention to that chapter. Chapter six is on skills. We're going over skills in class. Don't worry too much about it. Read the paragraphs in between the skills. All right. Okay. Next class, Monday at nine. You've got your review sheets over there. Purple is the color of the day. So you can grab your purple review sheet. If you find any errors, please let me know. Congratulations. Have a great weekend. And if you have any questions, write them down. I'll be happy to answer them on Monday. Try to do something fun this weekend. It's not all about school. Right. All right. Uh, those of you joining us um, virtually, thank you very much. We'll see you on Monday.
game show coming up next Tuesday. Make sure you tune in for the CNA game show where you can win prizes by answering test like questions. So all of you guys are invited to that as well. We will catch you on the next live stream on Monday. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter, everybody, to those celebrating. Happy Passover to those that are celebrating that as well. And um, happy caregiving, guys. Caitlin, you can go ahead and send us off.